Okay, Sergeant uh, Hannah, you can take it away with your opening. Okay, uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing. At this time, would all pan panelists please turn on their videos? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silence. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We're ready to begin. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. Thank you for joining us for today's triple joint oversight hearing. I want to thank uh, Chair Kalos and Chair Rose for co-chairing this hearing today. And we have also been joined by Council Member Rose Barron, Lewis Perkins, Rosenthal, and Balum. Before COVID-19 pandemic, many New York seniors has already endured many hardship, including food insecurity, social isolation, and gaps in provider services. COVID only further exposed and exacerbated the nightmarish reality for so many of our seniors. I said further intentionally because while our city is finally awakened to the challenges that seniors have endured for so long, many of us working in this space already knew that these issues existed. Many of us have been combating such issues way before COVID, especially our city's nonprofit providers. During this recent pandemic, nonprofit providers have fiercely ramped up their services. They have served more seniors than ever before and have become even more innovative <clears throat> to ensure that our seniors continue to be supported. To highlight a few examples, providers have been designing virtual programming to keep seniors connected while they're shelter at home. They have been organizing virtual check-ins to help combat senior social isolation. And very importantly, they have been expanding food delivery service to those seniors who are food insecure. I want to personally thank the nonprofit providers for their selfless service. I know while this is rewarding work, it is also challenging and often thankless work. This brings me to the Department for the Aging. I want to speak directly to the agency today. As many of our senior social service provider have highlighted that working with you has been very challenging at times. I cannot count how many complaints I have received from providers about poor planning and poor communications from DIFTA. These complaints has ranged from DIFTA sending unclear directive at the 11th hour to DIFTA providers, one set of instruction for contract expectation, and then going back on their words. Even more disappointing, I've learned that when nonprofit provider reach out for clarity, DIFTA is often unresponsive. How are nonprofit providers supposed to support our seniors if they are operating under an agency that is unclear, inconsistent, or unresponsive? I want to hear from DIFTA today. The aging committee wants answers. Why has the communication process been so fraught and unresponsive during the first few months? How will DIFTA change the operation to help better coordinate and collaborate with our nonprofit service provider? What will DIFTA do to change going forward? This hearing will also help provide clarity and understanding for the contracting process for our nonprofit aging service providers. We have some very vital questions regarding the current RFP process and the future of the home deliver meal program. Broadly speaking, however, our broader question 
for all these agencies testifying here today include understanding what happened with the contract and contracting process when COVID first hit. What is happening now and what is being done to account for contracting and service needs going forward. If we do not understand what happened during the beginning of the first wave of this pandemic, we will not be able to prepare for any possible future wave. And that is unacceptable. Our nonprofit service provider deserve better from the city than that. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in organizing this hearing, our council, Nusa Chadori, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, finance analyst, Daniel Krupp, finance unit head, Dohina Sapora, and also my legislative director, Miriam Gira. With that, I'd like to turn to my co-chair, uh, Chair Rose, for some opening remarks. Oh, Chair Kalos is here. So uh, I'm going to pass it over to Chair Cables. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, hopefully that is all of the hookups. I'd like to uh, start with a thank you to Aging Chair Chin and Youth Services Chair Rose for uh, participating in this joint hearing. I'm Ben Kalis, I'm the chair of the Contracts Committee. For those of you who are watching remotely, please feel free to participate in this hearing by tweeting me at Ben Kalos. Uh, this is an unprecedented time for New York City. What sets uh, this COVID-19 crisis apart from other recent catastrophic events like September 11th, Hurricane Sandy, or the Great Recession is the prolonged and unpredictable nature of this disaster. Back in March during the early days of this pandemic, I recall an interview with an emergency medical technician who described responding to the spread of COVID-19 like watching a mass casualty event in slow motion. That MTA was not wrong and this crisis is still upon us three months later. While things appear to be improving at the moment, as, as the city begins a cautious phase two reopening as of Monday, it's important to take a moment and reflect at what worked, what didn't, and what we as a city can do to respond to resurgences of the virus in the weeks and months ahead. We're not out of the woods yet, and it would be foolish to think that the virus couldn't return to the city. We're starting to see real spikes in infections in other parts of the country, and we want to make sure we respond quickly to appropriately if we need to go into lockdown again. The purpose of today's hearing is to analyze and evaluate the city's suspension of its standard procurement rules to respond to the COVID-19 state of emergency, how these emergency procurement measures were communicated to the city's nonprofits and human service providers, and what lessons were learned by the agencies and human service contractors in their effort to deliver on their contracts during this pandemic. On March 17th, the mayor issued an executive order suspending the city's procurement rules in response to the state of emergency declared by the governor. Pursuant to the city charter and state general municipal law, the mayor is authorized to waive sealed competitive bidding requirements for city vendors, in this case of public emergency. On its face, this meant that contracting agencies would face less red tape in obtaining essential personnel protective equipment from various vendors, that the city would be able to streamline contract renewals or modifications for critical work during the pandemic. In practice, however, vendors in the human services sector received inconsistent communication from their contracting agencies as to what expenses would be reimbursed as the state of emergency dragged on, and it became clear that the city would be facing a budgetary shortfall. Nonprofits in particular have had to invest their own, in their own PPE and technological equipment to continue operations, as well as hire a new full or part-time staff as their own workers got sick with COVID-19 and needed to isolate themselves. In a recent survey conducted by the Center for an Urban Future of the city's 24 leading nonprofits, several had already suffered losses of over $1 million, while many of the others expressed concerns of their own increased expenses and associated anxieties relating to looming cuts on the city's budget. In this instance, communication is key and the administration has gradually improved its messaging to vendors in response to their concerns. However, more remains to be done. The city's senior center provider network essentially converted into a meal delivery service due to limited 
guidance from uh, department from the aging is now fully within the office of the food czar. Will that network be reestablished in DFTA once the crisis lifts? What new expenses will be considered reimbursable under the pre-COVID DFTA contract? Summer cancellation of uh, various summer youth employment programs has been widely reported in the media and the guidance from the administration remains scant. What should the city be youth be doing this summer if SYP remains unavailable? Limited programs that are being reestablished covering just a fraction of the city's youth and it remains unclear what reassurances SYP providers will have in the future. Contracts will not be eliminated in the future. Um, I know we will be looking to both our uh, seniors, Chair Chin and Youth Services Chair Rose to follow up on those lines of questioning. To be clear, we recognize this is an extraordinary crisis and has been trying for all parties involved. We're not here to hang agencies out to dry just to do better to understand the agency communications process in light of the suspension of procurement rules. The challenge is still facing nonprofit providers and the lessons learned so we can anticipate and better address these problems if the virus has a resurgence before the vaccine becomes widely available. With that said, I know Chairs Chin and Rose are eager to make their opening remarks, um, and I will now turn it over to uh, Chair Rose. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Kalos and Chair Chin for convening this joint hearing. And to all of those in attendance, I say good afternoon. My name is Council Member Debbie Rose, and I am the chair of the Committee on Youth Services. I first want to thank the young people of New York City because you always have inspired me to be a better person every day. And I rest well knowing that you represent our future and your energy has just been invigorating. Um, but truthfully, I am resting a little less well in recent months. Indeed, I, like so many New Yorkers, still have optimism, but I also have more concerns than I did four months ago. COVID-19 has fundamentally changed everything we do, from how we learn and socialize to how we work and otherwise conduct our affairs. These changes underscore the ever important objective of saving lives and making sure our city institutions can respond to the challenges of fighting this disease. Our elderly and aging populations are among those most physically vulnerable to COVID-19 and the nonprofits that serve them have been busier than ever trying to provide safer, meaningful resources to this important population. And even though our youth may not have the same physical vulnerability to COVID-19 that our elderly do, they too have been impacted by this crisis, some in ways that will outlive COVID-19 and last their entire lives. When the city schools first transitioned to remote learning this past March, many of us still have faith that the safety net of after-school programming would continue even if they too transition to remote platforms. Time and time again, research shows that after school programs positively impact youth. Youth gain more in math and reading achievement than their peers. School attendance also improves while dropout rates decrease and they have better attitudes towards school with a decreased disciplinary incidence and experience significant reductions in drug and other drug use and other problem behavior. After school programming is vital and it works. Perhaps that's why 43% of DYCD's annual budget goes towards after school programming and it reaches over 110,000 youth per year. That's significant. Employment programs are also vital for our youth. Over 150,000 young people vie for 75,000 slots in DYCD's Summer Youth Employment Program, or SYEP. We know SYEP and other employment programs uplift impoverished youth who historically struggle to access the labor market. Tragically, these are the very youth who communities have, whose communities have been ravaged by the, mo the most by COVID-19 and whose futures we as a city must 
be investing in more than ever. I can still hear the collective gasp we all uttered when SYEP was simply canceled. And then summer after school programs were canceled and then Beacon and then Cornerstone all canceled. In total, all youth centered programming for summer 2020 was summarily cut. In the wake of these cuts lay our nonprofit providers who were ready, willing, and able to work on program alternatives. All they needed was a little bit of contractual and agency support. They did not deserve the cancellations, these abrupt cancellations. Let me remind everyone present here today that DYCD's strength is its network of over 1,200 nonprofit community-based organizations that enable it to provide so many rich youth opportunities and services in our city. They represent some 94% of DYCD's annual budget. Without them, DYCD is nothing. So going forward, I urge DYCD and MOX to learn from the past and forge ahead in support of our nonprofit providers so that they can continue to serve our youth. As we look forward to an uncertain future beyond this summer, it is imperative that we give more contractual guidance to our providers and engage them in conversations about how, how we can be more flexible with their contracts to meet the challenges of COVID-19. We cannot simply cancel our contractors. To do so would be to turn our backs on our youth and to cancel their futures. So before I turn the floor over to Council Member Kalos, I would like to thank my staff, Issa Cortez, Christian Ravello, Christine Johnson, and Venori Ranawara and my committee staff, Paul Senegal, Michelle Peregrine, Elizabeth Arts, and our newest addition, Anna Zemina, for all the work that they have done for this committee in preparation for this hearing. And I now would like to turn the floor back to Chair Kalos. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to Chairs Chen and Rose. I will now turn it over to our moderator, Committee Council Alex Ponoff, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chairs Kalos, Rose, and Chen. I'm Alex Ponoff, Counsel to the Contracts Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panel to testify your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony today will be Deputy Director of Policy and Partnerships at the Mayor's Office for Contract Services, Jennifer Guiling. Deputy Director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, Aaron Villari, will also be available for questioning. From the Department for the Aging, Chief Financial Officer, Jose Mercado, and Agency Chief Contracting Officer, Erkan Solak, will be available for questioning. And from the Department of Youth and Community Development, Chief Financial Officer Jagdeen Tanur, Agency Chief Contracting Officer Dana Cantelmi, Associate Commissioner of Youth Services and Strategic Partnerships Daryl Retre, and Assistant Commissioner Navita Bailey will all be available to answer questions as well. I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your question. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the committee chairs. All hearing participants should submit their written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Deputy Director Guiling, Deputy Director Villari, Chief Financial Officer Mercado, 
Agency Chief Contracting Officer Solak, Chief Financial Officer Fanor, Agency Chief Contracting Officer Pantelny, Associate Commissioner Retre, and Assistant Commissioner Bailey, please raise your right hands. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee today, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Director Guiling. I do. Deputy Director Valari. I do. Chief Financial Officer Mercado. I do. Agency Chief Contracting Officer Solak. Yes, I do. Chief Financial Officer Fanor. I do. Agency Chief Contracting Officer Ken Telmi. I do. Associate Commissioner Retre. I do. Assistant Commissioner Bailey. I do. Thank you all. Deputy Director Guiling, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Kalos, Shin, and Rose, and members of the Committees on Contracts, Aging, and Youth Services. My name is Jennifer Guiling, and I serve as Deputy Director for Policy and Partnerships at the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, MOX. Thank you for providing MOX with this opportunity to share the role our agency played in supporting human services providers during the COVID-19 pandemic response. I'd like to begin by noting that COVID-19 amplified the significance and relevance of the work that MOX has pursued over the years. Digital procurement, centralized guidance, standard practices, and collaboration were key to nonprofit business continuity during COVID-19. Nonprofit organizations that had teams dispersed across the five boroughs, working from home on laptops and cell phones, were able to maintain operations with the city because of online systems like Passport and HHS Accelerator. Digital practices like electronic signatures and electronic invoicing, and citywide coordination and guidance that was informed by provider input. The pandemic made it clearer than ever that we need to permanently institutionalize digital procurement through Passport and continue our efforts to create accessible and standard practices for all of our vendors. Turning our attention to the city's COVID-19 human services response, we all remember the tremendous disruption and uncertainty that ensued at the outset of the pandemic in mid-March. As the chairs noted, and I want to underscore, nonprofits are our essential partners and the city responded rapidly to support these critical human service providers, stabilize the sector and leverage communication channels. A centralized team, the C19 response team, focusing exclusively on business continuity for human services providers was formed with MOX, the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget, the offices of the Deputy Mayors of Health and Human Services and Strategic Policy Initiatives. Within a matter of days, we were able to reassure providers that their payments would continue uninterrupted as they worked with their contracting agencies on plans to deliver services in that fluid and uncertain environment. We met daily with city procurement and finance leadership to realize this goal. Over the course of the emergency response, from March 13th to May 31st, the city dispersed more than $755 million to the sector to support cash flow and allow for financial flexibility. Paying more than 9,100 invoices and initiating nearly 1,360 budget advances. As of today, nearly $900 million has been dispersed to human services nonprofits through nearly 14,000 invoice and advance transactions since March 13th. The C-19 response team also immediately issued guidance to ease administrative practices, allowing contracts to flow through the system and business to continue. Over the course of 11 weeks of emergency response, we issued seven guidance documents to the sector, 
targeted at ongoing business practices and maintaining the health and stability of our provider partner organizations. It was critical that our hundreds of providers received information and updates quickly and clearly, given the shifting nature of the pandemic and had an established pathway to communicate with the city. We created a staffed centralized service desk to respond to business questions and triage concerns. Agency COVID-19 liaisons were identified in each health and human services HHS city agency with whom we could coordinate rapid responses and bring open questions to resolution. COVID-19 liaisons met at least bi-weekly as a full work group to address sector-wide provider concerns and establish responses. We quickly created a webpage to offer up-to-date information from our team and across the city that pertained directly to human services business continuity, health and safety practices, and city resources. We also enabled partnership and information sharing through weekly conversations with more than 25 nonprofit membership associations, representing hundreds of nonprofit organizations. And in addition to those weekly conversations, we reached out almost daily to share critical updates in between scheduled video calls. It was through these channels that we heard about many of the challenges the sector's essential workforce was experiencing which enabled us to take fast action. We secured emergency childcare through regional enrichment centers and access to isolation hotels and testing for HHS provider staff. And just this week, we are coordinating with more than 800 providers to distribute 7 million face coverings for nonprofit staff and clients. Recognizing the critical role of disinfecting supplies and safety equipment in this period, the C-19 response team immediately advised that the city would reimburse providers for these expenses. We developed a standard approach applicable across the city's HHS agencies to maintain documentation and submit invoices, all in an effort to ensure prompt payment of expenses and save time down the line in reporting to FEMA or other oversight and response agencies. The COVID-19 response underscored the significance of many long-standing MOCS initiatives and our work to implement a digital procurement process with centralized practices, standard policies, and vendor partnership. That is why, as the city continues to move to reopen and then into recovery, MOCS will continue to pursue its mission and support human services providers through signature efforts. The continuing rollout of new passport features that will realize an end-to-end -end digital procurement system across the city of New York. Streamlining and standardizing audit practices and invoice review. Partnering in the city implementation team for the indirect cost rate funding initiative. Managing HHS accelerator and centralizing support for agency CFOs to enable providers to maximize cash flow through budget management and invoice practices. Beginning next month, HHS Accelerator will facilitate the disbursement of automatic advances at the start of fiscal year 2021 for registered contracts and approved budgets. A new initiative that the city instituted to support nonprofit cash flow during COVID-19 reopening and recovery. Said another way, the City of New York will be issuing 25% budget advances automatically and without any requests by providers. For all fiscal 2021 registered HHS contracts and approved budgets. This is money upfront and early that will allow for business flexibility and liquidity. Later this summer, MOX will issue guidance on streamlining invoice review to continue expediting payments through FY21. We are proud to be working on this policy with our city agency partners who were instrumental in our coordinated efforts during COVID-19. The upcoming guidance is informed by provider experience during COVID-19, and we want to acknowledge their partnership and open conversation, which enables this work. In summary, the city's COVID-19 human services response highlighted the necessity and relevance of many long-standing initiatives and values. Digital procurement, centralized coordination, 
standard policies, communication, and partnership. As we move forward, we will continue to hold these values while we also provide the kinds of outreach, technical support, and personalized guidance that help so many providers sustain operations during the emergency while developing new and enhanced tools to make it easier for the nonprofit human services sector to do business with the city of New York. Thank you for this opportunity to share the important work we pursued in collaboration with our city agency and nonprofit partners. I am joined today by Aaron Valeri, Deputy Director of Financial Services at MOX, and colleagues from the Department for the Aging, DIFTA, and Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD. We look forward to answering any questions you may have about our human services response during COVID-19. Thank you, Deputy Director Guylin. Next, we will hear questions from Chair Kalos. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Chair Kalos, please begin. Thank you very much. I'd actually like to turn it over to uh, Chairs uh, Chin and Rose, and I would like to acknowledge uh, Chair, pa uh, sorry, Powers, Council Members Powers and Rosenthal. Uh, okay, I am just going to start off with some questions for DIFTA, even though um, you did not provide testimony today. Um, I guess uh, the CF CFO, Mercado, and, and agency CCO, Solard, is, is here to answer question, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, Right now, um, DIFTA previously outlined concept paper and RFP timeline for NORCs, senior centers, and case management services. So has the department publicly updated these timeline so that providers can be able to plan? Given all that is going on, is DIFTA willing to commit to not issuing new RFP over the next year? given that COVID will continue uh, to destabilize the sector, the service sector? Good afternoon, uh, and, uh, council members and uh, everybody else. Um, the current plans for the next senior center uh, and NORC's RFPs are for new contracts to begin July, 2021. At this time, there are no plans for a case management RFP uh, as the current contracts began in fiscal year 18 and they are good to go until uh, the fiscal year 2024. So the, the current NORC and uh, senior center, their contracts are being extended. Uh, yeah, Is that what you're saying? Contracts, the senior center contracts and, and NORC contracts, they are uh, uh, being extended and they will be good until uh, fiscal year 2021. Um, yes, that's correct. Okay, so that's only one, one more year and that's enough time for you to do your RFP? For uh, the, the agency the is currently working on uh, concept papers, but we have not received, uh, we have not uh, you know, shared the concept papers with, with oversight agencies yet. Um, we can provide more inform information on, on those concept papers later on, but uh, we don't have any specific dates yet for the release of the concept papers, as they need to be reviewed and approved by the oversight agencies before they can be published. Okay, and what about the home delivered meal? I know that, you know, working with provider, we've been trying to get DIFTA to really push back uh, to the end of the year, but just to settle on, um, I think Wednesday is the deadline. How many uh, application have DIFTA received so far for the new home delivery meal RFP? Um, so uh, following an extraordinary 16 additional weeks of extensions from the original submission deadline, proposals for the HDM RFP are due uh, on Wednesday, tomorrow at 2 p.m. Uh, we look forward to sharing more details as appropriate at a later date. 
but as of uh, yesterday, we had about 60 proposals submitted for the 22 awards. Uh, 60, 60. Yes, that's okay. correct. Okay. And when you sort of like uh, looked at those uh, people who submitted, are the majority of them um, providers who've been doing this service for decades? Uh, I don't have the list in front of me, uh, but we have a mix of vendors, the current and the new vendors. Okay, I yeah, if you can share um, the list with us going forward, that would be great. Um, you know, in my opening, I was uh, a little bit critical of DIFTA because of all the complaint that we heard back from provider, especially uh, in the early part of the pandemic when a lot of the communications was, was very confusing. And uh, I know that when I asked for information, I got sent frequently asked questions. Uh, so a lot of the senior center and new providers have been going through a very rough time. And now the city is beginning uh, to open. Have DIFTA started to prepare with our senior center how they would um, provide service going um, going forward? Like for example, cooling centers are providing getting information. Are they gonna be the cooling center over the summer? I mean, the weather has been so hot. Um, are there like procedures, guidance has been given um, to the centers who are cooling center so that they can take care of our seniors? Uh, my colleague Jose will uh, will provide the response for this. Yeah, I have it. Sorry. Hi. Right. Good afternoon, Councilman Chin. Uh, this is Jose Mercado, DIFTA CFO. Uh, the COVID nineteen summer heat plan that the mayor shared on June twelfth is essential to helping New York City most vulnerable stay safe in their homes and cool during the summer. Under the direction and leadership of NYSEM, DIFTA, along with a number of other city agencies, have been part of the planning and implementation of, of all which consider COVID-19 and its ongoing evolution. The city is identifying existing facilities that can be used as key cooling centers, planning appropriately and social distancing and providing face covering. So what happened to our senior center? I mean, they are the logical place. They've been doing this for years and years. So are you working with the providers? Yes, we, uh, to help we, them prepare uh, to be able to provide the service. Yes, commit. Yes, Councilman. We've reached out to the providers, asking them whether they're basically ready to open up. We've provided surveys, we've provided some guidance, and we're still ready. We're waiting for them to come back to us to tell us exactly are they going to opt in to open or not. So you have a timeline for them uh, providing the information back to you. Yeah. Right now, for example, they're supposed to be sending us information tomorrow, um, Wednesday. Some of them have already asked for extensions since we're asking them to determine how much it's going to cost them to open up and, and project that. Okay. What about going forward? I mean, into the fall, into the winter. Is DIFTA planning with the provider how the senior center is going to be able to operate, uh, providing uh, social distancing and, and programming and, and a home delivered meal? Because one of the most important part that I wanted um, to talk to you about is that we do not want our senior center to disappear or to be decimated. Uh, throughout this pandemic, you know, they stepped up, they did the job, they provided for our senior, and we got to make sure they are kept whole. And I was very, very um, dissatisfied with the food program, uh, what happened during the pandemic that uh, the support was not given uh, to the senior centers, uh, the home delivery meal provider that's been doing the service for years. Uh, instead, the city contract with some of these private, uh, okay, some of them might be nonprofit, some of them are for profit, catering food company that has not been providing good quality nutritious food to our senior. And going forward, that cannot happen. It has to go back to our senior centers and home deliver meal provider. I want to make that clear. So the transition needs to start. DIFTA got a lot of money 
uh, from the federal government under the CARE package. And there was 170 million for meal. We got to make sure that our seniors are taken care of. So, you know, you have this get food NYC and all that grab and go stuff. I just want to make sure that DIFTA is working with our senior center to make sure, and our home deliver meal program to make sure they're getting the support that they need so that they can provide the nutritious meal that they have been providing for our seniors all these years. And I still haven't heard a plan, you know, from DIFTA. Like, how are you working with the provider uh, to give them the assistance so they can continue to hire locally? People who know the neighborhood, who can knock on doors, who's been doing this, visiting the seniors, be able to check on them versus food being left outside of building in the lobby. I mean, like, I mean, you heard stories all over the city and the kind of meal that the seniors got was horrible, some of them. Moldy bread and, and boxes of snack that are not meal. This gotta, this gotta stop. So we gotta make sure that our senior center that we fought so hard for will continue to expand. So it's different to working on a plan with the provider so that we can start this transition as soon as possible. I'm not talking about wait to the end of the year. I'm talking about beginning of July. Uh, the safety of, of older New Yorkers is our top priority and any decision to reopen is going to be guided by public health authorities. It, re it remains to be determined exactly when the Congress sites will be reopened. When the interim senior center providers continue to serve their members accordingly to social distancing guidelines virtually and remotely. Over the course of pandemic, senior centers, like you mentioned, serve grab and go meals. Some deliver directly to the homes of their members. Presently, all guests from New York City are authorized enrollers. And several NYCHA senior centers are also served as food distribution hubs. Our mutual hope is to return to some sense of normalcy as soon as it's safe to do so for the sake of all adults, adult seniors. Also, regarding the 170, uh, Councilman, the 170 was not part of the federal stimulus. We um, we received in DIFTA right now stimulus one and two was twenty six million dollars, which most of that went to uh, uh, to provide for the meals that we provide as a part of the emergency pro procurements. Yeah, but that money, uh, that part of the one hundred seventy million needs to go to DIFTA. We need to fight for a share of that money because otherwise it's being wasted right now, the way that is being used, and we have provider who knows the neighborhood who we have worked so hard to bring them in. And we have young people who can help do the food delivery. You know, we have local people that knows where, where the building is located versus we got taxi and TLC clogging up our street, creating chaos in my neighborhood and other neighborhood. That's got to stop. And I think Dipton really needs to work and fight for a transitional plan to start now. It cannot be taken over by the food star. Look, if the city wanna take care of the general population, go ahead. But the senior is the priority of the department for the aging. So I hope to see a plan as soon as possible from DIPTA, how you are working with the senior center to help them expand their capacity, help them prepare so they can continue to take care of the most vulnerable population in the city, our older adult population, and to make sure that they're taken care of. I wanna make sure that the service provider get the support they need and they do not you know, disappear, have to lay off people and that's what's happening now, and that cannot be, okay? So I hope to see a plan from DIFTA as soon as possible. Yes, Councilman, I'll relate back that request to our commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to send it back to uh, Chair Kalos. Thank you. Oh. Uh, 
Thank you to uh, aging chair Chen. I'll uh, just ask a couple of questions before I turn it over to uh, chair Rose. Uh, when the pandemic started, the governor and mayor began closing down businesses, large and small. When nonprofits providing services to seniors, youth and families living in poverty reached out for guidance, we and the council shared our concerns and received assurances from the mayor's office that these providers were deemed essential and would continue to be reimbursed. Uh, and as you testified, you apparently provided similar guidance about seven different times. Uh, I, I wanted to follow up in terms of what happened there because that guidance happened and then uh, several weeks later, um, I believe on less than 72 hours notice, I think some folks have had said 24 hours notice, the SYP contract was, was canceled. So I guess overall, are we still considering our human service providers, our senior service providers, our youth service providers, our providers who are addressing poverty uh, in, in food deserts and, and, and low income communities, are they still going to be considered essential? And are, are we going to see any further cuts or cancellations? Uh, can we have a commitment that the uh, city will give providers more than 24 hours notice? Uh, I'm happy, uh, Chair Kalos, to uh, sort of just respond to the guidance piece, and then I'll defer to my colleagues at DYCD on the SYEP. Um, but with respect to the guidance, uh, we did come out right out of the gate uh, with uh, information to help stabilize our provider partners and let them know that during a period of time that was so unclear and uncertain, um, and while they were working with their agencies to determine how to deliver services, um, during this completely unique uh, situation, uh, we would be there to continue to pay them and then we would continue to update them uh, as the pandemic um, evolved. And uh, I know we were all glued to our TVs during those first you know, month, uh, 11 weeks or so, where it was daily, hourly press conferences about changes in the environment. And so um, the multiple guidance documents were issued uh, with um, the intention of keeping up to date and um, uh, maintaining relevant information. And then along with the daily um, conversations with uh, individual providers, uh, with umbrella organizations, and then the weekly um, video calls, um, all in an effort to try to um, maintain communication during a period that was just so um, fluid um, and, and shifting. Um, and with respect to questions around SYAP, I'll defer to um, my colleagues at DYCD. It, it, it's, it's more generally beyond SYAP, also DFTA, they transitioned from having the senior congregate meals to moving everything out into uh, the, the city's meals program under somehow the Department of Sanitation, which is, is somewhat bizarre. So I guess overall uh, in society, we ask people to give two weeks notice uh, before they quit a job. Um, most contracts I've ever drafted have notice requirements about if people wanna uh, cancel their lease. Uh, housing has lease uh, notice requirements. So I, I think we can all agree that 24 hours or 72, if you're, if you're canceling something where human lives are on the line and, and people's jobs are on the line, several hours isn't good enough. Um, is, is there a rubric for what the best practice is for if you're not going to renew a contract or when we should suspend or, or suspend a contract. And I'm happy to also hear from DYCD and DFTA, but I, I do want a, some sort of commitment in terms of uh, weeks or months versus hours. Well, hello, I'm Jadine Fenor, um, Council Member Callis. Um, I think I wanna speak specifically to the SYEP cancellation. Um, DYCD's first priority is the safety of our youth. And I think at that given moment um, in the pandemic, that was the earliest or that was the most um, up-to-date information that we had and safety was priority. And, um, you know, we care about um, providing safety for our youth and there were serious concerns at um, that point in time. And so, um, you know, it's unfortunate for the cancellation um, we are hoping through budget um, negotiations that we can secure an alternative um, SYEP in regards to giving a commitment. Um, I'm unable to do that because we are guided by what the budget um, outlook looks like. And, and DFTA? 
terms of your own suspensions and cancellations? We didn't have any suspensions or cancellations. In uh, my, my understanding is that you, you moved the senior congregate meals over uh, from senior centers and I, I believe the uh, aging chair w went into this and uh, it got moved over to DSNY and being ha handled by uh, caterers who had never done this kind of work. And uh, I just want to echo uh, the chair's sentiments. And I think I'm working on introducing legislation with Borough President Eric Adams on, on legislating food quality issues with what some of the vendors you contracted with uh, were distributing. No, I understand, but at the same time, so, so I guess from anyone, is there anyone willing to make a commitment saying that if we sign a contract with a nonprofit that we won't just cancel it on a couple of hours or days notice? Okay, um, I guess just a quick question to Mox. Is there, is there any reason why we can't console our $75 million contract with IBM and use that money to fund all the senior and youth services because literally we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollar contracts, a million dollar contracts. And like there's this $75 million contract with IBM. There's a $25 million contract with, with other uh, similarly situated vendors, KPMG, Northrop Grumman. Can we just cancel four or five really big contracts to save $300 million and just fund everything else? I'd rather con cancel on blue chip companies uh, than on the providers providing essential services. Yeah. So, uh, Chair Kalis, I, I understand. Contract services, we actually don't manage contracts or between agencies and uh, their vendors and their providers. And so the, and the question about a contract document in of itself is not um, what MOCs oversees. Um, we oversee the uh, procurement process, um, and again, we're you know looking forward to moving uh, forward with a digital practice that creates transparency and visibility into the procurement practice. Um, but I can't answer questions around uh, contracts between agencies and vendors. Sure, but uh, are you in receipt of my request for all of those three hundred seventy-six million dollars in contracts? Mm -hmm. Not sure about the specific request you're asking right now. I uh, have seen um, letters and um, requests, but happy to circle back with you, uh, Chair Kalos, after the, the call. I know Mox is um, no worries. actively just, just working those, with you in your office. Those, just for those watching, I have requested all of those contracts that I referred to, and I will be going through them personally. And hopefully, if we can get it before uh, July 1st, we can go in and start canceling and trimming some of the fat on these very large contracts that I still don't know what they do and I'm not sure anyone else does. Uh, you mentioned it in your hearing, in your testimony. So uh, last year was the first year was I, as I was chair of uh, contracts committee where Mock started doing the 25% uh, payment. Uh, how many of the vendors were you able, specifically human service vendors, were you able to actually get paid 25% up front? And as we head to July 1st, which is about, uh, seven or eight days away, um, are you on track to getting everyone paid out their 25% on July 1st, while we still haven't even necessarily passed the budget? Yeah, um, so great questions. Thank you for asking. Um, yeah, so again, the policy um, as, it's, as it currently stands uh, is that uh, registered contracts and approved budgets um, are entitled to at least a 25% advance. And the way it currently stands is providers request uh, an advance. To be clear, during the pandemic, uh, the city uh, came out um, in March and just initiated a second set of advances to help with cash flow. That was a unique response to the pandemic. Um, and it was feedback from providers was that it was extremely helpful um, as they were trying to pivot and make sense of the situation. Um, learning from that experience, we have instituted a new approach for next week, July 1st. Uh, instead of requesting an advance, the city is automatically uh, providing those advances of 25% for the registered contracts and approved budgets. Um, so the, to the question of where we are with that initiative, so um, 
Mox is extremely focused on that as our city agency partners. We work in collaboration as our providers. Um, uh, part of the registration process is signing uh, contracts and getting documents um, into agencies. So we've been working really closely with providers and agencies. We've instituted new rules to help providers get the documents back during COVID. So electronic signatures, waiving notary requirements, um, uh, things of that nature um, to allow for providers to uh, submit what they need to submit and um, allow the process to go forward. Um, we are moving very quickly. I was emailing with providers this morning. A lot of the agencies here on the phone today are working with us um, and we're hopeful as we move towards July 1st um, that we will get as many as possible ready for registration on time. Do you know what percentage are still unregistered and how what percentage are already registered? I don't have that information right now, uh, but we, I mean, we'll have it uh, <laughs> in just a, sh a few short days for sure. We, we have a number of people watching on the internet. We have a number of people who are participating in the Zoom. Uh, what day should people expect the payment? What day should they reach out to, to some, who, who's, if, if you are a provider, you just got this great news that checks are coming in, that the checks will automatically be issued, I'm assuming through ACH or some other wire transaction, not just checks in the mail, I hope. Uh, what day should they expect it? What day should they reach out and who should they reach out to if they need to get paid? Yeah, so I'm gonna defer a bit of that to my colleague, Aaron, but uh, I just wanna take you up um, on, I'm, I'm interpreting it as an invitation uh, to share information to the providers who are listening and watching. Um, if you do have contracts uh, in your inbox that need to be signed, please, please, uh, return them as soon as possible. Um, it's again, electronic signatures, email signatures are acceptable during COVID. Um, if there's documents that need to be submitted and especially if there's budgets that need to be uh, submitted, please do so as soon as possible. If you need assistance, if you think there's something in your inbox, you're just not sure, you can reach out at help at mocks nyc.gov. We are happy to help you. Um, it's a team effort and want to get us to the finish line. And then with respect to the timing for the advances, I'll defer to Aaron. Before we go to Aaron, I just, I have a competing email address and I, I think I insist that the help at mox.nyc.gov was, was created in response to our email, which is contracts at bencalos.com. So if you need help, email help at mox.nyc.gov and copy counsel at bencalos.com and uh, both of us will work together to make sure you get the assistance. Erin. Thank you, Council Member Kalos. Um, so I think the first thing that a provider should do is log on to HHS Accelerator and check the status of their budget and contract for FY21. They can get up-to-date information 24 hours a day. Um, I'm happy to report that we are partnering with the city agencies to create a process for uh, dispositioning all the advances on registered active contracts for FY21 and agency, the HHS agencies have already actually uh, prepared hundreds of the advances to date. And so once the budget is adopted and the fiscal year begins on 7-1, those uh, payments will be executed through an EFT, uh, no checks in the mail, through an EFT. Uh, and so providers should expect to start seeing that uh, the first week of July. I want to just dig in on the mayor's executive order, uh, which suspended the city's procurement rules on March 17th. That was supposed to uh, standard competitive bidding rules were no longer in place and that agencies were able to select vendors for essential services or equipment without standard contractor evaluation processes. I'm curious, what has been the biggest impediment to properly vetting contractors during this emergency? Were there any instances where vendors were approved for PPE contracts that could not deliver? And how can vendor evaluation be improved even in a state of emergency to only don't lose valuable time awarding contracts to inexperienced or incapable vendors? Um, as folks may have read in, in Cranes, there was a $70 million contract for uh, different PPE supplies that um, I, I believe they still haven't been delivered. And I'm even curious if we've been uh, how much we've paid out on that and how much we will be getting in return. Um, so happy to, to uh, respond to that. Um, so the executive order did allow us to suspend um, and streamline some of the usual requirements to allow for contracts to begin more quickly. 
Um, with respect to specific contracts, happy to circle back offline with the appropriate folks from Mox to answer those questions um, and to continue that conversation. Uh, and I'll just wrap up with a, a last question before I turn it over to Chair Rose. Uh, our understanding is that the RFP for home delivered meals is due tomorrow, despite requests for delay and inaccurate unit targets following the increase of meal serving during cor coronavirus. Uh, when, why hasn't the FTA issued an addendum indicating the new levels of meals that will be expected to be served and correspondingly delay the due date? Can you repeat the question again, uh, Chair? The request for proposal for home delivered meals, uh, is, is it due tomorrow? That's correct, yes. And so the question is, have you, have you received request to delay it because providers are concerned that the that inaccurate unit targets, which means that they're, they're, the contract doesn't provide for enough meals because we're now serving more meals during coronavirus. And uh, we're asking why Department for the Aging hasn't issued an addendum to uh, re recalibrate for the new meal need during coronavirus and whether or not you are planning to do so and whether or not you will extend the deadline in so doing. So uh, uh, this RFP has been issued in January and uh, with a due date of uh, March uh, 3rd. And then since then we have uh, uh, extended the RFP for 16 addition additional weeks. Um, <clears throat> and the, the current contracts for these uh, services are, are going to expire at the end of December 2020. So um, um, we, we, we believe that we have given enough time for the vendors to uh, prepare their proposals and the, uh, uh, submit their proposals. And we are not sure how long this uh, uh, pandemic is going to you know, uh, uh, last. So uh, it is difficult to plan uh, when, you, when you don't know uh, what to expect. So it wouldn't be uh, a, a good you know, thing to include uh, uh, pandemic related uh, 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 assumptions into the NRFP that will have uh, you know, a, a longer uh, contract terms. I, I would just argue that as we prepare for a, a second wave and we have to deal with the now, uh, if, if this is something, I, I think we'll have an idea of whether or not we're seeing a second wave and how long that second wave is going to be, probably in the fall. So I, I would just say that we should either recalibrate for what we're seeing right now today uh, and perhaps end up in a situation where we might have more food, but I, I just, I don't see hunger going away. I'd like to turn it over. So, so I just urge you to please push the uh, due date out, perhaps even into the fall, if, if you feel like you need more certainty. But um, I, I haven't heard any doctors or Anthony Fauci saying, we're done, go back to normal life. What I'm hearing and what I'm seeing throughout this country is spikes and people preparing for a second wave. I'd like to, I, I've taken too much time, so I wanna turn it over to our uh, Youth Services Chair, Debbie Rose, to follow up on summer youth employment and everything that our, our youth providers have had to deal with. She mentioned it in her statement and she is our champion on this and I'm just here to help. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Kalos. And um, my colleagues have all been stalwart in this battle, you know, to get youth funding um, re, uh, reinstated in the budget. So I, I wanna thank you all. Um, and, uh, and, Mox, and the MOX guidance from uh, 3-18-2020 uh, for human service programs was, they issued this guidance um, on 3-18-2020 for human service programs, but it only covered the period uh, up until 6-30-2020. Uh, if programs can't meet their contractual demands due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, will they be penalized in the next fiscal year? 
Um, so thank you, Chair uh, Rose, for your question. The um, What I can say is that we uh, appreciate the fact that COVID is continuing um, and that uh, the city will be supporting providers as we move into the next fiscal year. And as we've been working with each provider, um, each agency, I should be clear, it's each agency working with their contracted provider on understanding how to deliver in a COVID environment. They'll continue to do that as we move into the fiscal year. Um, with, uh, with that, would um, providers, uh, could the providers roll over any unspent funds from their fiscal 2019-20 contracts um, to cover summer expenses? Uh, especially if there's no funding in the adopted budget? So questions about budgets um, should really be directed to contracting agencies. Um, uh, this uh, group, um, it's, it, uh, one, it's between the agency and the provider. Um, two, um, it's hard to answer the individual questions in this type of a form. Um, and from um, a policy perspective, it's, um, that's MOX oversees the procurement process, um, not the budgeting uh, process. So um, it's not really I'll, a I'll speak with, comment on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll speak with DYCD about that. Um, with the abrupt canceling of, of the summer programs, uh, staff, um, many of our contracting agencies uh, were, were forced to lay off staff so staffing up for summer programs and uh, school year programming traditionally occurs months ahead of time. In order to complete the necessary background checks and trainings, the staffing challenge has now been exacerbated by um, you know, providers' inability to financially retain their staff. Will DYCD advance funds to support providers in staffing up for summer, and um, especially if we're uh, successful in providing uh, summer programming funds. And what will the advanced policy for a fall programming be? And will DYCD work with DO, DOHMH and OCFS to deal with the rush of applications for background checks in order to avoid the nightmare that um, we experienced last fall. Thank you, Chair Rose. Um, and we look forward to whatever funding um, is afforded. As always, you know that DYCD um, in the past has been able to ramp up um, very quickly. In regards to um, advances, unfortunately, um, you know, without um, summer programming, we, it's going to be um, hard for us to do advances, but what um, Navita and I have done with our team is we are working together um, with um, our ACO and our fiscal team to figure out how, if we had to roll out a program, what we would do to facilitate cash flow to providers. Will we be able to do that in a timely manner so that they could be up and running? So I, you know, I put my right hand up and I'm, I'm going to be honest here. Without um, a, a, a mechanism to, um, especially since it was canceled and contracts may not be registered for a portion of our SYEP contracts, um, getting in advance is going to be tough. I know that um, Dana and I, who's our ACO, spoke about the possibility of trying to get them um, funding from the loan fund. And so, as I indicated before, we, we understand um, the strain that our providers um, are, are experiencing. And um, it's always our effort to work collaboratively to try to get them cash flow. That's my, my staff's primary goal. And we'll do everything in our power to make sure that we could get them funding um, to operate these last minute programming if in the event we are getting funding. Um, the, you know, because of the cancellation, the executive budget um, co cuts cause many of the providers and the CBOs to furlough their staff or lay off staff. Um, do you have a number that can you give me the numbers of the Compass, Sonic, Beacon, Cornerstone, 
SYEP staff who have been furloughed or laid off as a result of these cuts? We've been so trying I'm to get that number. So at this time, we don't have the number. Um, what I can say to you is that in each of the prospective areas, program folks um, have gotten emails from staff who have indicated it. And um, if possible, we are going to try to see if we can pull something together. But at this present time, I don't have those numbers for you. Um, when do you think that you can get them? Uh, because we're trying to um, formulate a budget that will, you know, take into consideration and, and compensation for, for those staff members that were laid off. Um, other than doing a survey, like I said, sporadically, we would have providers, um, you know, voice their concerns about, you know, is there going to be funding? We have to furlough staff. At this present time, it's only those one-off emails or providers that have reached out to us. We haven't collectively um, figured out how we can survey a larger, um, um, a larger group of our providers to do so. Um, I will definitely um, take this back to the executive team to figure out how we can try to pinpoint um, numbers. But at, that, at this present time, I don't have it. And I understand the urgency and the need to. And we will put our heads together to try to make sure that we could get something together if possible. Um, I, I'd like you to just talk to me about um, the communication between DYCD and the providers. Um, I understand that there's been, um, you know, a, a contract based weekly calls to the providers, but they've only been listen only. How is DYCD engaging providers and creating a space for them to offer questions and feedback? And um, how are the questions responded to? And are there questions and recommendations incorporated into any living, you know, F FQA, A FAQ um, document, you know, for dissemination. So I'm going to, I'm going to pass this on to Daryl Rattray, but I can say to you that um, with the guidance and the collective um, collaboration between MOX and OMB, we have worked to kind of distribute some of our own FAQs in, um, you know, frequently asked questions. So I'm gonna to pivot to Daryl and he could speak more um, in detail about what's happening in the program level. Okay. Good Hi, afternoon, Chair Rose, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, great seeing you. So yes, we do have, of course, the daily communication with our providers. Um, we do have the weekly calls amongst the different program areas. So the during the RHY call, um, that's an open call where providers can ask questions during that time period. Um, our calls with the Compass and Beacon and Cornerstone programs, because on each call we have over 150 people on those calls, um, it's a little problematic to have people chiming in all at once during the call. So for those, we have collected questions beforehand and read the responses out during the call. Um, and that's been an ongoing process. But um, since the last hearing that we had, um, we have had prov uh, prov CBO supervisory calls as well. So we've had supervisors of providers on calls where they are, that's an open dialogue. They are able to ask questions during those calls um, and have conversations. And actually for the past two weeks, we've had calls with executive directors as well that again are open video conference calls where they can chime in um, get answers directly, and if we don't have the answer, we definitely get back to everyone. And um, when you have the big call with all of the beacons and cornerstones, um, and the questions are submitted ahead of time, how do you address the questions that don't get um, answered during these video conferences? Is there any mechanism in place to get back to um, the, the questioner? with the answer? Yes, and we, so after each video call, we do a follow-up email to everyone that was on the call. And actually, even if you weren't on the call, but you're part of the portfolio, you also received that follow-up email. Um, during calls, absolutely right. We've had questions that up until the point of the call had it been answered, but and we addressed that part of it. Hey, we know all of you are reaching out about this. We don't have an answer yet. We're working on it. We're gonna get it out to you. Um, so that's also something that we include in that dialogue. 
you mentioned RHY, and um, we've received some um, correspondence that they've submitted invoices for um, for additional salary and OTPS costs due to COVID-19 uh, for reimbursement, but they still haven't been reimbursed, nor has DYCD communicated with them when, when they should expect the funds. Um, what, what's, what's going on with the communication with the providers and when can they expect to be um, fully reimbursed? So I'm, I'm going to start and then I'm going to um, transition or pivot to Navita Bailey. Um, in general, um, the process, as you know, with this pandemic, um, moving swiftly, um, we know it's in, instrumental to cash flow to our providers. I think with the guidance along with MOX and OMB, we were able to send out a template for providers to kind of distinguish between what are co uh, COVID expenditures and non-COVID expenditures. Um, providers, um, as you can imagine, um, you know, providers took a while to get us back the information. After we got the information, my staff had to vet the information because there were certain line items that they were putting in that um, perhaps, um, you know, um, OMB um, and others didn't feel were um, things that we could put in um, based on um, reimbursement. And um, we shared it um, with OMB. And since then, you know, we are communicating back and forth, working collaboratively. So I will say that, you know, we could um, streamline that process a little bit better. We have every intention of making providers whole. We're just trying to get the details done. As you know, the city is in um, a budget crisis and um, we're looking for, um, you know, other funding streams from the state and other places to be able to help, um, um, you know, Supplant, you know, not supplant, but to um, to fill some of those gaps um, that we have in the city. So we want to make sure that we get it right um, as soon as we can. We will send notification out. I can assure providers that while they're doing the work, um, we will not leave them on the hook. We have reached out. We have said this is something that we're going to do, and we just need to finalize them. I think I spoke a lot, Navita. So I don't know if there's much that you need to add to that. But um, Chair Rose, it's definitely our intention um, to get those numbers out. You know, DYCD does not work independently. There are other um, approvals that we need um, um, to move forward. And um, again, cash flow, getting information to our providers is key to us. And um, if it's not, you know, received on a timely basis, trust me, it's not done out of militia or anything of that sort. Um, I, I think the problem is is the lack of communication that, you know, um, granted, we know that there is an issue with cash flow, but um, a, a couple of phone calls, you know, actually articulating what is happening and what's, what efforts are being made to get them reimbursed, I think would, you know, go a long way. So um, I, I would like to see that there's some more communication with, with the um, RHY providers. And, 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 and as soon as you have some sort of timeline in which you think that you know, these reimbursements will be made or will be forthcoming, that you express that to them. Definitely. Um, and so uh, I, I just wanna say that um, part of the problem has been um, that people just are, they feel like they're functioning in a vacuum that, you know, the guidance has been limited from, from MOX in terms of, you know, next steps, where they're, they're going to go after 630. And the fact that um, they have had enough contact with you to know um, we're continuing to fight. I am, I am so sure that we're going to be able to fund some of youth programming. And I want everybody to be able to get up to speed and, and running so that our most vulnerable youth can actually have um, valuable programming this summer. So um, I, I do, there's a lot of other people who have questions. So I'm going to... Uh, give them seed my time back to the chair. Uh, thank you, Chair Kalos. 
I want to again thank uh, the committee, this hearing's co-chairs, uh, Rose and Chin. I'd like to now turn it to council member Inez Barron, who has been waiting very patiently, but first our uh, moderator and committee council, Alex Polinoff will read some ex uh, from some questions. And uh, I urge any other council members to raise their hand at this time. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Thank you, Chair Chin. Thank you, Chair Rose. Uh, I will now call on council members in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet raised your hand, please do so now. You will have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and I will let you know when your time is up. Once I have called on you, please wait until the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your question. First, we will hear from Council Member Barron. Thank you so much. Mr. Barron, your time will begin now. Thank you so much. I want to thank Chairs Chin, Rose, and Kalos for having this opportunity for this hearing to play. My the Department of Aging. We are having a problem in getting acknowledgement for questions that we raise. Our questions, our emails, our calls are not responded to. And that's unacceptable for an agency. We are now at the point where there are organizations that have been told that they cannot spend funds because are being delivered by other organizations. As an example, we have an organization, Wayside, that was allocated $75,000. They have spent 30 and have been told that they cannot continue to spend funds because they are no longer providing essential work. They had a $31,000 contract from aging and the contract was, which they normally would uh, continue to uh, submit in the normal process has not been with different question become, they want to purchase tablets for the seniors. Must they now amend the original contract to indicate that? Is that something that will be approved so that they can be reimbursed? Or will the funds be able to be rolled over to the next year? My time is ticking. Did you hear my question? My colleague is going to respond, but he's muted. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, Commissioner Barrow. Sorry. Commissioner Thank you. Um, I'm assuming that the, this contract is actually a discretionary contract. Correct. Right. I mean, that's actually a discretionary. That's a decision done by the city council, not by not by deputy. Okay, that is something that we brought to your attention and we still have not heard. And we said that uh, the, the city contract is willing, the city council is willing to do that, but that the provider must have a contract with DIFTA in order to claim its reimbursement. So that comes back to you. The so, we, so this is a discretionary council contract. has no objection. You haven't registered the contract that they want to submit. So it's back to you. So I will look into that and get back to you, Con Right. When will you do that? Because today is the 22nd or whatever. Time is ticking. People have to be able to know that they're registered and they've got like seven days to spend the money and get the items. This has been totally unacceptable. This is not something new. And we are very disappointed that we have not gotten responses to these questions, which have been submitted in writing and have not gotten a response while the time is ticking. So when will you get back? Will you get back to us before the close of business today or by the end of business today? When specifically will we hear from you? I will look at it today and, try and do my best to see if I can respond back today. If not, definitely by tomorrow. Okay, and who am I speaking with? Who am I hearing from? I don't Jose see Mercado. your name, it's not on my screen. All right, so Jose Mercado, if I, Chief Financial Officer. Thank you. And you'll be 
from my Debbie Simmons. She's my contact person. And her email is jsimmons at council.nyc.gov. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Barron. I'll now turn the floor back over Thank to Chair Chin with additional questions. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the home delivered meal RFP. Now we've heard that the demand has gone up 20, 30%. So, I mean, is SIFTA looking at really pushing back the RFP and see how you will be able to meet um, this growing demand uh, for home delivered meal? Because we don't know when this pandemic is going to end. Uh, so you to an RFP that do not provide uh, sufficient funding uh, for the number of meals or the reimbursement rate, um, that would not be acceptable. So how is TIFTA dealing with that? Uh, open communication with providers and regular review of our data systems are key to successfully tracking increased demand. In FY 2019, the average home delivered meals was approximately 17,300. As of April 2020, we have seen an increase of about 20%. While there are clients waiting for a full in-home assessment, the increase of which is consistent with home delivery increase, there are zero clients waiting for meals. Any traditional CMA clients waiting to be added to the home delivery program, which is approximately 209 individuals enroll in Get Food New York City immediately in the, in, in the interim. But there were, there were other seniors that got signed up for the uh, get food NYC. And what I've heard, even from the commissioner, I mean, that number has like increased to almost like 100,000. I mean, a lot of seniors who are not, who were not connected uh, to senior centers before, now they heard about, you know, food programs. So they signed up with the senior center and they're, they're getting other services, which is great. Um, but at the same time, we got to make sure that's sufficient funding to be able to take care of the increased demand uh, that we are seeing. As I said, you know, the, the pandemic is, we don't know when it's going to end. And, and people are aging every day. The senior population is growing every day. So there's going to be more and more demand. Um, how, how is DIFTA going to be able to meet that? Uh, okay. The other question uh, that I didn't get to um, asked earlier was, you know, I was talking about the cooling center. Uh, I was just want to make sure that is DIFTA also requesting extra funding uh, for these centers who are going to be cooling center to provide overtime and, and services so that the senior center that are going to be cooling center are not going to get short change. I'm going to answer the first question. Uh, DIFTA will continue to work with OMB regarding the council's request for increased funding for home delivered meals. On the second question, we're basically right now sending, we sent out a survey to, the, to determine what is the cost to reopen as cooling centers. Like I mentioned earlier, we're, we're supposed to be getting them by tomorrow and we'll know exactly how much it's gonna cost to do so. Well, in your conversation with OMB, I mean, we put it out there from the council. We're asking for 26 extra million dollars for the home delivered meal program. And I wanna see that 10 million that was promised in the model budget that was supposed to be in this year's uh, preliminary budget, wasn't there. Executive budget, wasn't there. It better be there before we adopt the budget because that money is desperately needed uh, by our senior center. My one last question is for Ma. Uh, I don't know if you have the information uh, in terms of the, the private um, food service company um, that got into the Get Food NYC contract. Do we know like how much are they getting paid uh, of the salary or uh, hourly pay rate that they are providing to the food preparer and uh, the people who deliver the meal? And what's the rate that they're getting uh, per meal, these private contractors? Yeah, I don't, we don't have that information, but I'm happy to go offline and, uh, you know, get the appropriate colleagues uh, to help uh, answer your questions about that contract. 
That would be helpful because I've been asking and I haven't uh, gotten any information back. I want to see like who are these private um, catering company, you know, how they're paying people the amount of money that they're getting uh, for the kind of food that they're providing. And I want to make sure that we're not wasting money. So if you can get that information to us as quickly as possible, it will be appreciated. Thank you. I pass it back on to Chair Kalos. Thank you to uh, Aging Chair Chen. Uh, and uh, just checking to see if we have any additional questions. Seeing none, uh, we will begin our first panels uh, from the public. Uh, I would like to turn it over to our uh, moderator, Alex Polinoff. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Thank you, Chair Chin. Thank you, Chair Rose. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panelist has concluded their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant at arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome MJ Okma to testify. After MJ Okma, I will be calling on Tara Klein and then Gregory Brender. MJ Okma, you may begin. Alex, okay. I'm sorry to interrupt. Councilmember Rose uh, raised her hand, I, I believe, uh, at the end of the admin testimony. I believe she may have a final question for the admin before they leave. Thank you, David. Councilmember Rose. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to ask um, uh, uh, two uh, COVID related um, questions. Um, due to the, uh, the elimination of summer programs, providers have been told that uh, there's no storage or rent that will be available to programs over the summer. So what does DYCD um, want the providers to do with supplies and equipment? And in the cornerstones, the CBOs are usually the ones tasked with securing the facility and supplies. They are also the ones reporting to NYCHA for necessary repairs. Without Cornerstone programming over the summer, who will be responsible for the security of these facilities and the supplies for the summer? No. Did the admin leave? Are they gone? Is the USD still here? Okay, I'll I'll just follow up with the questions that I have. I'll I'll send them I'll send them to the to them directly. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Sorry. Thank you, Chair Rose. Uh, once again, we're going to turn to public testimony now. Uh, again, we're welcoming MJ Okma, Tara Klein, followed by Gregory Bender. MJ, MJ Okma, you may begin. Time to begin now. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Kalos, Chin, and Rose. My, MJ, my name is MJ Okma with the Human Services Council, a membership organization representing over 170 human services providers in New York City. The cost of COVID-19 that has been passed along to humans, the human services sector has been immense. In a time when these programs need more support to meet growing demands, vital services have been cut and threatened. This choice disproportionately impacts communities that have been hardest hit by this pandemic due to structural racism, ableism, and income inequality. Last year's indirect investment was an important step forward that many providers are deeply relying on during this time. And while it's vital that this commitment is held steady, this investment alone does not address the full scope of, under, of the underfunding crisis facing the sector long before this pandemic. It is impossible to separate the issues discussed today from the looming fiscal year 21 budget. 
The city government has already eliminated necessary services with little notice, and we've been given no sense about what the final budget could look like. On June 10th, HSC sent the city council a letter joining the call for a reduction of the NYPD's operating budget by at least 1 billion in fiscal year 21, and out, which also outlined line some recommendations to help redirect those savings into vital social services. Under the purview of DYCD and DIFTA, those recommendations include fully restoring all summer youth programs, including Compass Sonic, Beacon, and NYCHA-based Cornerstone programs, which are facing 79 million in cuts, saving the summer youth employment program at a cost of 124 million, funding the current home delivered meals program with an immediate 26 million in emergency funding to help cover the real cost of the program while allowing time to pull the drastically underfunded current RFP and rework the program with direct inputs from providers and releasing funding for the Unity Works program, a workforce development program specifically aimed at creating work and education opportunities for homeless and runaway LGBTQI youth at a cost of 2.7 million over four years. The contract of this RFP has already been awarded, but the funding has been put on pause. Expired. Additionally, the city must start paying human services workers fairly. City, um, these city contracted workers, the majority, which are women of color, are some of the lowest paid in our city's economy. The small increase they do receive in the form of a COLA is set to expire unless it's included in the fiscal year 21 budget. A 3% COLA for these workers would cost 48 million. Um, for decades, despite, despite small incremental changes, the city has asked human services providers to do more with less. The system is now at the brink of failure and the time is now for bold action. Thank you so much for providing me this opportunity to testify and for your partnership on these deeply pressing issues. Thank you, MJ Okma. Unless there are questions from the members, we will move to the next panelist. Seeing no additional questions from the members, we will now move to Tara Klein. Ms. Klein, you may begin. Thank you, good now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, no, now we can't hear you. You may have to push the unmute button. There you go. <laughs> Nope. Ms. Klein, you're you. muted again. Hold on. Okay. You're unmuted this is now. good. Great. Yes. So sorry about that. Um, thank you so much to Chairs Kalos, Chin, and Rose for hosting today's hearing. My name is Tara Klein with United Neighborhood Houses. UNH is a policy and social change organization representing 43 neighborhood settlement houses. Settlement houses have been on the front lines of the COVID-19 emergency response by continuing to deliver essential services to New Yorkers, including providing emergency food, counseling, shelter, youth and family supports, and more. Um, my written testimony highlights more details around aging and youth services contracts. Uh, I'd like to briefly highlight some of the aging concerns and align ourselves with the testimony you'll hear next from Gregory Brender and Campaign for Children on Youth Services Concerns. Um, so I'd like to discuss the Home Delivered Meals RFP and program. This is a DIFTA contracted program that includes meal delivery, case management, and in-person wellness checks to support the most vulnerable homebound older adults. During COVID-19, home delivered meals providers were instructed to continue business as usual. At the same time, the program saw demand increase rapidly with many indicating a 20 to 30% uptick in clients as urgent community needs grew. This underscores our major funding need we've been requesting for $26.2 million for the program. So DIFTA currently has a new RFP out for Home Delivered Meals program. This was released before COVID-19 hit and since then has been postponed several times. It's currently due tomorrow, the 24th, with contracts scheduled to begin January 1st, 2021. So the RFP lists the number of meals to be served in each catchment area of the city, but these numbers are no longer accurate given the increased demand we've seen and uncertainty about how these numbers will change in the future. Further, providers are still responding to the COVID-19 crisis and are focused on running their programs and applying for emergency funding sources. A pandemic is not the time for the city to release a new procurement, and this RFP must be postponed until after COVID-19 has subsided. This holds true for any other procurements DIFTA has on deck, including senior centers, NORCs, and case management. These procurements must remain on hold until after the pandemic subsides. 
My written testimony also highlights some of Ms. the challenges Bart. around the city's emergency meal provision for older adults through Get Food and uh, some questions around how that program and its funding will wind down. So thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Klein. Unless there are questions from the members, we will move to the next panelist. Seeing no additional questions from the members, we will move to Gregory Brender, followed by Caitlin Andrews and Carlin Cowan. Mr. Brender, you may begin. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify and, and thank you Chair Kalos, Chair Rose and Chair Chin for convening this important hearing. Um, as you know, the most drastic cuts made in the mayor's um, executive budget were to DYCD. And this is gonna, the impact of these cuts will impact the providers, the contractors who make DYCD programs work well beyond the summer when the cuts are happening. As we speak, youth services workers are receiving layoff and furlough notices because we have not had these programs restored yet. The council has been such a strong ally in pushing to restore these programs. And we ask not only that you push to restore them again, but that you, you push the mayor to restore them now so that before people leave their jobs, before layoffs go into effect, we can start planning programs to go into place in the summer. As you know, and as Chair Rose mentioned, um, providers immediately adapted when COVID-19 struck towards um, remote models, towards socially distant in-person models um, in the RECs and want to continue to provide those services in the summer. Um, in order to ensure the um, successful transition of programs, we urge DYCD uh, to make adjustments to the work scopes and budgets for DYCD programs, including enrollment and rate of participation expectations, um, amending budgets to reflect additional expenses from COVID-19, and amending per child costs to, refl to reflect fewer children in single classroom settings. Thank you uh, for testifying and for all your leadership to support these programs. We need the city to act now to fulfill the commitment that the mayor made to transfer funds from NYPD to youth services and act now in fulfilling that promise and restore Compass, Sonic, Beacon, Cornerstone, and SYP. I'm happy to take any questions and thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Brender. I'll now turn it to Chair Kalos who has questions. Uh, th thank you, uh, Greg. So I, I saw on TV, I saw Mayor de Blasio on TV talking about millions of dollars available for cure violence and other youth programs. And so that was at this point, at least more than a week ago. Um, so are you, are you saying that the mayor hasn't made that money available yet? Um, there, is, there is money available for cure violence as far as I understand, but there are still huge amounts of the system, including most of the programs which are run through Compass, Sonic, Beacon and Cornerstone for after school and SYP for youth employment that are entirely eliminated for this summer. So we're still looking at a summer where tens of thousands of young people will be deprived of the opportunities to work and more than 14,000 youth workers are being laid off. There's a pandemic out there, right? There is. What are kids going to do this summer if they don't have summer camp and summer jobs? I think it's going to be a huge challenge for keeping kids to social distancing. They've already lost um, engagement over the past uh, several months, having not been in school. They need this connection to both caring adults and to their peers that youth services programs can provide. Um, so it's it's a big unknown, and I think it's a a really important question um, that honestly our mayor needs to answer because right now the services that are keeping kids engaged that are helping them have positive experiences are slated to close. How many kids are you talking about for your for the the uh, summer programs that are part of the uh, settlement uh, housing settlement network? Um, I can get you that number. We, I don't have it on the top of my head, sorry. But it's it's um, within our network. It's um, it's several or, thousand, or or generally. I, I know yeah. that. I, if um, I recall, that number is in the tens of thousands. Yeah, um, it's it's over one hundred and seventy five thousand children affected by this cut. Uh, I see uh, the youth services chair Debbie Rose vigorously. <laughs> uh, uh, nodding along, and I'll uh, see if she wants to, to jump in and, and interrogate you as well. Oh, thank you. 
I, uh, I don't want to interrogate uh, Greg. Uh, he's a wonderful advocate for our young people. But um, okay. I like the questioning, um, Chair Kalos, um, and you're, you're calling to, to question how, how youth programming could be zeroed out in the midst of a pandemic when our young people need these services more than ever. And so, um, yes, it's over 175,000 young people who will be impacted by, uh, by this, the budget as it stands. The mayor did restore some money to youth, but not to the summer youth programs that we, we have been targeting. It was for NEON, it was for a NEON program, and it was for um, a paltry number of 3,300 slots, mm -hmm. as opposed to the over 175,000 um, slots uh, for various summer programs, uh, Sonic, Compass, Cornerstone, Beacons, SYEP, Work, Learn, Grow, um, all of them were zeroed out. So, um, uh, you know that the council is fighting to restore funding to all of those programs, and um, and it has had an impact on our providers. Um, and so I'm really thankful to you for having this contracts meeting because uh, with the the sudden just cancellation of funding to their programs, it has impacted their ability to be able to um, have a full-fledged um, summer youth programming uh, as we knew it in the past. So um, I'm thankful for getting all of these, this information on the record so that we have more ammunition to fight in our budget negotiation talks that are ongoing. Thank Along you. Along with um, Campaign for Children and Campaign for Summer Jobs have actually submitted a summer recovery plan with both in-person and remote options. I know that uh, Chair Rose has seen it, but I'll also submit it in the testimony uh, and to Chair Kalos um, and anyone else who wants to see it so that, um, and it's on the website of campaignforchildrennyc.com. Um, so there are plans out there that providers have worked on uh, who have experience doing both remote and socially distant in-person programming. Like to recognize uh, Chair Chen. Thank you, Chair. I great. Thank you for the testimony, Tara. I I agree with you. To providers have plans. Your experience, you know what to do. I just can't understand the administration and the mayor. Like, hey, during the summer, kids can still learn with you know virtual programming that they have been getting right now from a lot of the youth service providers. It's creative. Why not allow them to continue in, instead of terminating their contract? It makes no sense. Okay, and don't give us the excuse that it's a safety issue. Okay, the providers can help deal with that. And same thing with the senior provider. They can deal with this safety issue. I mean, there could be social distancing. Not every senior has to congregate together, but there are ways that you can have a smaller group or whatever, and you can still do the virtual. It's been going on. Come on, just fund the programs and provide the support. Simple as that, instead of gutting everything. And I think that's why in this budget, we cannot allow the administration to get away with it and just use the thing about, oh, the pandemic is still going on and we have to worry about safety. No, talk to the people who's been doing this, talk to the providers, support them, support our youth, support our seniors. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Chin. Chair Kalos has additional questions. Uh, and, and just to be clear, how much was in the budget for you before the cut? And what is the rest of what, how much money does it cost to get these 130,000 kids uh, engaged positively this summer, socially distanced and keeping them healthy and engaged? Uh, this was a cut of uh, 215 million. Um, we do project that there are additional expenses, uh, particularly for in-person programs related to uh, PPE um, and other costs for uh, socially distancing. 
So you're saying that it would cost a fraction of our city's heat, light, and power bill. Uh, the, the, my projected savings for what the city saved in heat, light, and power off of its $713 million budget is about $176 million. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe the number you're talking about is less than the police overtime budget uh, and the cost of having the city invest in, sorry, spend money on policing our children instead of investing in them. So um, would you would you support cutting overtime for the NYPD to uh, instead take that money from paying police officers to uh, police our children to have your organizations work with them? I think there's a lot of people who would, who would be, and I think there already are people in the streets saying, we need to get behind moving money out of NYPD um, and into youth programs and other social services as well. Uh, those are those are my questions for this witness. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Thank you, Mr. Brender. Uh, unless there are any additional questions from the members, we will move to the next panelist. Seeing no additional questions, I'd like to call Caitlin Andrews to testify, followed by Carlin Fallon and Joanne Yu. Ms. Andrews, you may begin. Thank you. My name is Caitlin Andrews. I'm the, with Live On New York. Thank you, Chairs Chin, Kalos, and Rose, and the full committees for the opportunity to testify. With a base of more than 100 community-based organizations, Live On New York's members provide core services that allow older adults to thrive in their communities. So before highlighting the areas which we need improvement, I would like to first express the good news. Over the past few months, the resiliency, adaptability, and strengths of senior service providers has been on display like never before. With that said, the challenges have been significant. Amidst death, grief, and fear within the senior community, the demand for services has spiked significantly. Some delivered meal providers have reported a 20 to 30% increase in demand in March alone, and now are disallowed from accepting new clients in many cases. Case management four times the usual increase level served just during the initial phase of grab and go meals. These challenges were all incurred against the backdrop of a chronically underfunded system with home delivered meals providers reimbursed 20% below the national average, case management systems receiving no new funding to address rising demand and senior centers even seeing the $10 million that was promised to them for FY21 being neglected from the executive budget. As it is June 23rd and the budget has not yet been adopted, I would be remiss not to implore the city council and the administration to fully fund senior services, including the 10 million promise for senior centers and the $26.2 million that's needed for home delivered meals in the FY21 budget. Now, some examples of the contractual challenges that have emerged. Without clear communication, that is the headline. Uh, on, May, on, on March 15th, the mayor announced via press conferences that senior centers would be closed the following day. Unexpired. That means that senior centers got no time to create new programming or prepare for that change. They learned of this through that press conference. Moving forward, we need to have better communication specifically on plans for reopening. And most specifically, I know I'm a little over we right. need to make sure that seniors Take time to finish your testimony. Sure. We we need to make sure that seniors are aware of the cooling centers that will be open in their areas. The purpose of emergency preparedness is to make a plan. Seniors need to know now what will be open, especially with a heat wave coming next week. There's a lot more in my testimony, but I appreciate the opportunity to share just some of the things that we can learn from from the past few months and improve on moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Andrews. Do any of the chairs or other council members have questions? Seeing none, we will move on to our next panelist, Carlin Callen, followed by Joanne Yu and Beatrice Diaz Taveras. So Carlin sorry, Callen, you may I just to wanna jump in and I'm sure the aging chair will, will have questions. Uh, so, so we heard the administration raise issues of, of safety. Um, and uh, I guess the question is, is there a way for this uh, so, so we so one challenge is that it's going to get hot out. It's already hot out. It's it's pretty muggy out. I was out this morning at six a.m. and it was already hot at six a.m. Uh, what kind of uh, dangers would our, our seniors going to face 
at home this summer uh, versus if they were able to actually go to cooling centers, how are we able to do things safely and what kinds of uh, safety measures are available so that we can uh, make senior services available again in person. So what I think is most important is to lay out the op options that seniors will have early so that they can discuss with their senior um, providers, the senior center case managers, et cetera, what makes sense for them. So some seniors may be able to participate in the AC distribution project that's going on and that will be sufficient. Others may not be able to do that for a variety of reasons, potentially cost of the utilities being one. Um, so they need to be able to talk with providers and say, where is a cooling center? What makes sense for me? And those discussions can only happen if we have a clear plan laid out now. I think that there are many senior centers that want to operate. They know that they can enforce social distancing within their center and would love to be a part of the solution. There are some that say, I'm located in senior housing and this just doesn't make sense. It's too much of a risk. But I think having those conversations and then laying out exactly what's going to be available in every single community is the first step to making sure everybody can have a plan and execute it to make sure that they're safe and healthy during the heat. During this pandemic, have your members seen the cost of food go up like we've seen all over the country? Have they seen their SNAP stretched thin? Has their SNAP and food pantry been insufficient and have it, they had to rely on senior centers provide additional access to food. Absolutely, food is the number one concern that we've heard during this time. And more specifically, we are really concerned about the fact that drivers have had no access to incentive pay. It's been the position of the city not to provide incentive pay for the drivers of home delivered meals who have remained on the front lines, interacting with seniors every single day. Um, the food is the biggest challenges. We know that moving forward, senior centers could be a solution and create culturally competent meals as they have done for decades and continue to provide these safely, but without adequate funding to cover the full cost, um, that's a solution that's untenable in the current state. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Andrews. Are there any additional questions from members? Seeing none, we will move on to the next panelist. Next, I will call upon Carlin Cowan, followed by Joanne Yu, followed by Beatrice Diaz Taveras. Ms. Cowan, you may begin. Good afternoon, and thank you to the chairs for holding this hearing today and for your attention to this really urgent issue. My name is Carlin Cowan, pronouns they, them, and I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer at CPC. CPC has been serving immigrant and Asian American communities since 1965, and we have supported our communities through all sorts of crises. And so when the COVID-19 crisis hit, we knew we had to respond to support our community members quickly. The city of New York could have made this easy, but it didn't. The city of New York could have made it possible for us to rapidly transfer our services, adapt to new and emerging needs, and make sure that our community members were able to safely receive services given the current conditions, but that's not what happened. When the news of the shutdown happened, what we immediately did was reach out to the city to get assurances that our contracts would be kept whole so that we could adapt our services and meet the needs of our community members, which they did provide us. But what we didn't know is that that assurance was only if the contracts were actually going to be kept. So we told our staff that they were guaranteed to stay on with us until June 30th. And then after that, a week later, we heard that our senior services were being cut. And we learned that through a press conference on a Friday afternoon, when we had seniors already planning to show up on Monday for food. We then worked with our seniors to begin home delivering meals and learned that the city was going to be doing that as well. And we had seniors that were not receiving food, seniors that were going hungry, seniors that were receiving inadequate meals, um, and seniors that were frankly afraid of opening their doors to a city worker rather than a trusted community member because they have fears of ICE. Then just a few weeks later, our youth services contracts cut just overnight with barely enough time to Hi. even have our programs closed, pull information from the database or close our doors. 
we had to scramble to figure out how we would keep this program together. And ultimately, we are being forced to let off a number of our staff for that program. In the meanwhile, our young people have been texting staff with suicidal thoughts because they don't know how their families are going to make ends meet or how they're going to afford to bury our parents. And that will be the loss of our connection to those young people if we are not able to serve them. Simply put, CPC will try our best to meet all of our community needs, but when our budget is being slashed by a million dollars, when we are being forced to lay off 100 staff, it is simply not possible. And when that happens at a moment's notice with no time to repair, it means we cannot prepare our community members either. At the same time, the city is continuing to fund the NYPD at the exact same essentially rate that it has. And the city is too concerned about laying off officers and actually reducing the headcount and reducing policing in our communities. Yet the city is essentially letting go hundreds if not thousands of human services workers who are going to be critical to our recovery without blinking an eye. So I implore you and thank you for working on this matter please defund the NYPD, reallocate that funding to our communities, to human services that will be here for our communities through their recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cowan. I will now turn to Chair Kalis for questions. Uh, thank you for your courageous, honest, and very straightforward testimony. Uh, and uh, thank you for being the first panelist to say defund NYPD. I agree, we must defund NYPD. Did I ask you to say that? <laughs> Just want to make sure that- No, you did not. And I will happily say it again. We need to defund the NYPD, invest in communities and invest in human services. Uh, would, would you support uh, cutting the next graduating class from, uh, sorry, uh, cutting the next a uh, uh, cadet class to save four million dollars and that that would actually help restore funding to your organization and, and several others that would be I would, dollars and I would absolutely support cutting that class and furthermore I would support going further to reducing the headcount of the New York Police Department in a meaningful way that actually reduces the policing of our community members, of young people of color, of low-income folks, of black and brown communities all the police are doing is criminalizing their poverty, criminalizing their lived experiences. And what we know is that it is community-based social services that actually supports and uplifts these communities. And during this economic and public health crisis, we are needed more than ever. That $4 million that you say alone, that could fund hundreds of young people to be engaged in summer programming and supporting their community members through COVID-19. That $4 million, could pay for thousands upon thousands of meals for people who are homebound as our waiting list for food pantries and for food services is growing exponentially. 50% of our community members have lost their jobs or income. We need to invest urgent funding into services for New Yorkers, not policing them. 50% of your community members. 50% of our community members and wellness checks have lost jobs and income. Uh and, and how many of those community members were able to access unemployment benefits through the state or federal uh, benefits? Unfortunately, not a lot of them. Just as an example, for one of our preschool families in Queens of 24 families, 20 of those families lost jobs in the first two weeks of shutdown, and less than half of those families were able to access any sort of federal or state benefits. And they are left with the forcing themselves to choose between paying for food, they're waiting to get evicted when the eviction moratorium expires, which is today. These are the investments we need to be making is supporting these New Yorkers. These are some very stark realities um, and, and just horrifying, especially the messages you're receiving. The fact that people in the community feel that they can text you and share their thoughts and get the support they need. but. Uh, with with uh, laying off 100 staff, I imagine that is more challenging than ever. And yet I, it seems like I imagine you're still rolling up your sleeves to do more with less. Uh, I, I wanna ask just very specific questions just to get the facts out there because I think the public needs to know and I'm, I'm hoping folks are paying attention here. So um, the city sent out letters saying that services were gonna be continued. You were under the rightful belief that you were safe until June 30th. Uh, how many hours notice did you get on the cut to SYEP? Less than 24 hours. We were told one afternoon that our programs were ended the next day. 
that would not have been enough time, even if we were um, fully in the office for us to update all of our program participants, close out the program in terms of its actual planning, as well as financials, to have our staff clean out their desks. And again, you are talking a workforce of low income, people of color, paid minimum wage through city contracts, often immigrants, that the city was essentially willing to let go on less than a day's notice. At CPC, we have been able to scramble to promise to guarantee those staff through June 30th. And that means that myself and other leadership team members are taking a pay cut that we are reallocating from other programs. Other agencies that are smaller do not have the ability to do that the way that, they, that we have been able to. And therefore they had to lay off staff very quickly following that notice. And the thing here is that we're at June 23rd. And so if the city decides to bring those programs back it's gonna be really hard because a lot of those staff are already gone. And if, and hopefully when the city realizes that human services are going to be central to any kind of economic and public health recovery that we have, if these community-based organizations have laid off significant amounts of staff, or if God forbid some of them have even gone under, those organizations are not gonna be there to serve our community members. And we are so vital to this recovery. We need the city to recognize that. Uh, you mentioned the senior service cuts to your senior centers. Uh, how many hours or days notice did you get on that cut? We were told, first of all, on a Friday afternoon that we were no longer able to do our congregate meals, even though we had been working very hard with social distancing and sanitary and PPE practices, um, and that that was effective um, as of that Monday. But we knew that seniors were already counting on us for a meal. Our meals are 70% of their daily nutritional value. And we know that a lot of our seniors do not get anything else to eat besides what we feed them. And most of our seniors face digital access and literacy issues. And so there's no way to notify them. And then again, when we moved from grab and go meals to the DIFTA home delivery, we were given barely a day's notice on that. And so we knew that again, our list of seniors was not going to be the same as the list that DIFTA had. We were immediately hearing reports as soon as, as soon as we started of seniors that were not getting meals that we then had to scramble and pull together donations to make sure that they didn't go hungry. We heard of seniors receiving meals that were basically made up of crackers, applesauce, juice, um, and other things that were just really not nutritionally appropriate. Um, and we heard of seniors that were just confused by the new system, particularly our limited English proficiency seniors and scared to open the door because we have been since uh, 2016 teaching our community members that you do not open the door. And so our seniors were literally forced to choose between the fear of deportation and not going hungry. That, that's a lot of last minute ca cancellations. Uh, so one place is we can defund NYPD. Uh, another question is um, we, we are currently spending $84 million with IBM uh, for something called citywide SI class two projects. Um, do you have any idea what that is? Because I, I don't. And does it seem like it might be better to cut one multi million dollar co contract with IBM, Deloitte, Accenture, or Northrop Grumman? Uh, together, they would be worth about $375 million, or should we keep cutting? Uh, services to, to youth, seniors, and those living in poverty? I don't know what those contracts are. And so, you know, I can't say with certainty that we should cut something that I haven't heard of. But my general instinct is that for the city to continue paying out our corporate contractors for whatever those services are, while um, not paying and cutting contracts for our vital youth services, our senior services, our community services, is mixed up priorities. The city should be first preserving the needs of New Yorkers, which is funding human services, funding education, funding our youth programming, meeting our needs during this crisis, and then think about paying out our corporate contracts. And frankly, maybe think about if they're even really necessary. Uh, thank you. And, and I did not pay you to say any of this, right? Uh, thank you. And I guess just as I go, if something's in the budget and it is so opaque, that we don't know what it is. The mayor's office of contract services doesn't know what it is. And it is hundreds of millions of dollars. That's when I say that's, that's time to cut. I don't know anyone in their right mind who would keep paying 
even a dollar if they didn't know what it was for. So thank you and we will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cowan. Thank you, Chair Kalos. I will now call the next panelist, Joanne Yu, followed by Beatrice Diaz Tavares, followed by Dana Alpin. Joanne Yu, you may begin. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to submit this testimony. My name is Joanne Yu. I'm the executive director of the Asian American Federation, and we represent a network of 70 member and partner agencies that support the Pan-Asian community. Um, at this point, uh, we I probably would have been parked in your office to do some best uh, budget advocacy, and we're grateful that you, uh, you guys are all fearlessly leading our city at this point. Um, Council Member Rose, uh, your office was the last meeting that I had with before the, uh, sh the shutdown. So I feel particular um, affection to, um, in seeing you here and just wanted to let you know that through our census work, we were able to reach 100,000 uh, Staten Islanders um, on the, um, with the census uh, and, and getting an, and over delivering on our numbers. I am um, extremely grateful for this opportunity. I wanna talk about um, asking, my testimony is to really ask for support for the hardest hit communities, um, those who have suffered socioeconomic neglect and lack of funding for years. And that is the communities of color who have been chronically under-resourced. So none of this, uh, the death rates and, and the challenges in our community should come as a shock to anybody who, uh, who understands how the city dollars are divvied up. Um, as uh, council member Chin can uh, tell you, uh, Asian American seniors were the fastest growing senior population. One in four seniors live in poverty with poverty rates reaching as high as 35% for Bangladeshi, Bangladeshi seniors and 30% for uh, Chinese seniors. Asian, uh, Asian American seniors living in poverty of, the, of that, the population, uh, the limited English profici proficiency rate is 83%. And um, obviously the, we have the highest rate of senior mental health um, services needs. Uh, we have 40% uh, of the seniors experienced, uh, we have the highest rate of suicide of all the senior populations. And so what I wanna ask, obviously what COVID has exposed is chronic- Time's expired. So my recommendation quickly, um, address the growing needs for in language and culturally competent take, take healthcare and mental health services. Take all the time you need. Thank you raise reimbursement rates for ethnic home delivered meals and allow congregate meals uh, to happen. Uh, continue funding senior centers for immigrant population initiatives. Um, I can tell you that of the 70 nonprofit organizations, and there are many allies here who talk about um, the meal programs, but the reality is that all of the money that has, is being um, divvied up between um, senior services, Asian American and communities of color, we are the last to know. And there have been some money that has been um, allocated during this pandemic. And, um, you know, I keep a running email with my colleagues who serve other communities of color, and we didn't even know about that. And so right now, no, not one Asian American nonprofit has its own Meals on Wheels contract. So we are um, obviously um, behind, uh, just sh so shortchanged and so underfunded. Um, as, Colin, uh, as Carlin mentioned, you know, obviously um, there's tremendous need, but we also need to acknowledge that there's a real economic reality that communities of color have always been underfunded and under-resourced. So we need to amend contracting process to allow Asian and nonprofits to more accurately reflect cultural and language expertise they bring to the senior population. We understand the importance of SYEP because of the fact that they serve low-income kids of color and it's an opportunity for them to be able to raise their families out of poverty. So we know that there are lots of uh, budget requests um, in front of you. We ask you to recognize the fact that this what this pandemic has done is to uh, shed a, uh, shine a light on the communities that have never gotten the resources and that will, and will continue to not get the resources. Even though, you know, to be honest, you know, everybody's, everybody's saying all the right things, but when it comes to money, we know that, um, we know how this is gonna go. And so I guess I'm gonna just say, um, you know, people talk about culturally co culturally competent meals. They talk about language access. They talk about funding nonprofits, but those non none of those um, 
those elements, those, those critical needs will reach my community. And so I'm asking all of you for our support to ensure that not just Asian Americans, but communities of color get the resources that we need to serve our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yu. Unless there are any additional questions from the members, we will move on to the next panelist. Seeing no additional questions from the members, I'll now call Beatrice Diaz Tavares, followed by Dana Altnew and Joseph Perry. Ms. Diaz Tavares, you may begin. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairs Kalos, Chin and Rose, and committee members. My name is Penny Bunyaparoch. I'm the Director for Contracts Management at Catholic Charities Community Services, which provides basic human services in Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. The suspension of both SYEP and summer camp programs promises to leave thousands of children without constructive activities and guidance this summer. As you know, immigrant children and families, many of whom were excluded from the federal stimulus packages, will especially be worse off. Commitments by members of this council and the mayor to redirect funding into youth and social services would pave the way for empowering development through investment in communities of color disproportionately affected by COVID-19 and the murders of George Floyd and so many others. Should SYP funding be restored, we have the staff and equipment ready to act immediately to resume operations and allow children to gain the valuable career experience and life skills that SYP provides. For the more than 500,000 undocumented immigrants in New York City who are left out of the federal stimulus programs, funding may provide not only legal assistance, but case management, mental health care, ESOL, and job training assistance. We support increased investments in these services because we see the benefit they have on the city's most under-resourced communities, and we know that they will be critical supports for these communities as we collectively recover. The city's record of handling youth and human services contracts is one of limited successes and significant shortcomings. The suspension of SYP contracts with only 24 hours notice caused widespread turmoil among youth services providers and casts doubt on the city's willingness to deliver on its contract and budgetary promises. The council's discretionary guidance came a month after the pause order and caused enough confusion to merit subsequent guidance and an FAQ. Despite these additional communications, city agencies continue to reject contract invoices for clearly established essential services. While council staff has been assent, have been helpful in our attempts to rectify these issues, these are symptoms of a more systematic bureaucratic opacity. In addition, contract registration delays continue to be commonplace. Providers wonder if their FY20 contracts will be cut before they're ever expired. registered. This is not to say that among the city's failures there are not areas of improvement. Changes to contract advances and invoice review as well as the launch of Passport could usher in a period of greater transparency and accountability. The city's commitment to the indirect cost rate initiative, if adhered to universally without exceptions for emergency contracts, is a promising step to ensure that nonprofits can provide needed services without taking on losses. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Unless there are any questions from the members, I will move on to the next panel. I see Chair Kalos has a question. I'll turn the floor over to Chair Kalos. You're with the Archdiocese. Can you give us just a scope of just how big the Archdiocese is and, and how many folks you, you work with and uh, serve? Yes. Um, so Catholic Charities Community Services is within one of the 90 agencies within the Archdiocese of New York. Um, Catholic CCCS um, covers Manhattan, the Bronx, and, and um, some of Staten Island and some of the um, Hudson Valley co uh, counties. Our agency alone serves about 140,000 individuals with various basic uh, needs. Um, the Archdiocese of New York covers um, 10 counties, including New York City and the Hudson Valley. Um, hundreds of thousands of households, uh, youth and families are, are served by our, our services. What, what does it look like if things continue the way they are versus how things have been going? In terms of SYP, Beacons, Compass, our after-school programs um, that have been suspended this coming summer, we we have not, we have been playing a waiting game, um, basically, uh, just waiting to hear from the city agencies on what our next steps are going to be. Um, thousands of children are going to be basically um, not able to participate in any kinds of activities over the summer where they could be provided meaningful um, meaningful activities through our counselors through through people who who would be able to 
to provide those activities. Um, okay. Um, and, and I guess one of the things you, you were talking about, some of the contracting, it just seems like your organization is very large. Um, so any pointers you have for the city and, and dealing with, with similarly large numbers of people and large numbers of subsidiaries and, and sub providers and subcontracts, I'm incredibly open to and also happy to just turn it over to Chair Rose. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I had talked about was the indirect cost rate initiative. And I know that that was an initiative that was um, started uh, more than a year ago. Um, I think that if, if we could um, push that forward and ensure that um, our contracts can be made whole in order to provide these services, um, that would be one large step um, in, in ensuring um, continued uh, services. Um, that's, that's an essential area. Thank you. I'll now turn the floor over to Chair Rose for additional questions. Uh, be before that, just a quick response. In terms of if you're having any trouble with the indirect rate, please reach out to the agency you're having issues with, uh, who hopefully should have stayed on this, uh, this, but we will be making sure that they come back and watch this and get back to you. Uh, but email help at mocks.nyc.gov and email contracts at Ben Kalos and the, the relevant chair, whether it's uh, Rose or Chin or both of them, and we will be there for you to make sure we support you on the indirect. Turn it over to Chair Rose. Thank you. I'm sorry, I think it's muted. Chair Rose, me too. Okay, thank you. Um, the Archdiocese has uh, both senior and youth programs. Um, do you, can you give us a number of how many, um, uh, what staff layoffs, how many staff layoffs they might have been as a result to, uh, of the zeroing out of the youth contracts and, um, and cuts to senior services? And how many seniors and youth were impacted by um, these cuts? I don't have that information right away. And our sister agency in Staten Island, Catholic Charities of Staten Island, operates the senior centers on the North Shore, as well as um, after school programs. So I, I can certainly get that information to you. I'm, I'm sorry, I think it's on mute. Thank you. Um, because we've been trying to get some type of headcount of how many staff members have been impacted by these sudden cuts as well as we know we have a number for the youth. So um, it would be really helpful if you could get back to my office so that, um, and, and let us know. So um, again, we can use that as some type of barometer in terms of our negotiations and how much monies um, we should be actually asking for um, in, in this, the next budget. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs. I'll now turn to Dana Outman to testify, followed by Joseph Perry and Aya Ibrahim. Ms. Outman, you may begin. Thank you. Now. Thank you. Thank you for hosting today's important hearing on nonprofit contracting during COVID-19 with a particular focus on youth and senior services. My name is Dana Altmue. I am the Assistant Director of Government Contracts at Good Shepherd, Good Shepherd Services. Guided by social and racial justice, Good Shepherd goes, partners and grows with communities so that all New York children, youth, and families succeed and thrive. We have seen numerous rapid changes to contracted programs with youth services being forced to significantly, sh significantly shift their operations overnight in order to comply with health and safety guidelines. The supports that GSS provides both pre-COVID and during COVID are even more crucial to assist our communities now. We understand that difficult choices have to be made, but urge the city to preserve key programs and investments in the human services sector, including last year's investments in the higher indirect rates and, sal and sa salary parity for early childhood educators, so that the sector remains stable over the coming months and, continue to, and can continue to work with helping New Yorkers recover. 
Additionally, the mayor's three-year COLA investment comes to an end this year, and it is vital to continue COLAs in the years out. An investment in COLA is an investment in essential nonprofit workers. The most dramatic cuts made in the, in May, in the mayor's um, budget are to DYCD, as we've all discussed. Um, these summer programs include Compass, Sonic, Beacon, Cornerstones, and SYEPs. And for Good Shepherds, this will directly impact roughly 300 partic 3,000 participants. The cuts also threaten the infrastructure of community-based organizations who serve youth. Um, I can tell you for Good Shepherd Services, we have laid off over 300 staff. It is the single biggest layoff of staff at one time since our inception in 1947. It is vital that contracts reflect the changes that have happened or the changes that may need to happen for programs to reopen with programmatic or fiscal modifications in order con to conduct safe in-person programs. Additionally, budgets need to be modified and allow for new costs such as food for families and other items that are necessary. Um, many of our DYCD, con DYCD contracts um, have been busy distributing food and have been working at the RECs, which um, are in collaboration with the Department of Education. And in order to create equity across all GSS programs, staff that are reporting to program sites and working in person are being paid one and a half times pay. Unlike some other contracts, these programs are not allowing us to charge, even when there are funds available in the contracts, are not allowing for us to charge this one and a half times pay, and therefore Good Shepherd is needing to take on this financial burden. Furthermore, we urge UICD to work collaboratively with providers on work scopes and budgets to reflect the new realities that we are facing during this crisis. Thank you, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Unless there are any questions from the members, we will move on to the next panelist. Seeing no additional questions from the members, we will move on to Joseph Ferry and Ia Ibrahim. A note to the muter, please unmute them both together since they will be testifying together. After Joseph Ferry and Ia Ibrahim, we will move on to Rachel Gazdick and Fagad Noel. Mr. Ferry and Mr. Ibrahim, you may begin. Time starts now. Thank you to uh, Chairs Kalos, Chin, and Rose uh, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Joe Perry. Uh, I'm with the Junior Achievement of New York. Uh, for those who don't know us, we're the largest nonprofit organization in the greater New York area dedicated to creating pathways to economic empowerment for young people kindergarten through 12th grade. Our mission is to teach and inspire young people to understand the economic world around them, plan for their financial futures, and to make the most of their potential with the premise that knowledge and access leads to empowerment. Uh, Junior Achievement of New York provides free programming to students who reside in 49 of the 51 uh, city council districts in all five boroughs. Uh, as you may know, financial literacy, entrepreneurship and workforce readiness are not part of the regular required curriculum in New York state. And that means that most students graduate without any meaningful exposure to basic pocketbook e economics or to the larger topic of how our economy works. Without this kind of literacy, our students are at great risk of becoming adults without learning how to make smart financial decisions and plan for their futures. We create partnerships between hundreds of businesses and over 300 local schools, summer programs and after school providers in the city that help uh, shape the next generation of community leaders, workers, consumers, and innovators. And as we continue to grapple with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have transitioned uh, to remote learning opportunities, uh, digital uh, transition that was really already underway prior to the pandemic, but that we have been able to um, accelerate during these past months. Uh, JA students are reflective of New York City's communities. One fifth of our students are black, a quarter are Asian, and nearly 50% are, are Latino. Nearly 80% of the students we serve qualify Time's for expired. free financial, uh, free uh, federal uh, student, uh, student reduced lunch programs. Many come from immigrant, immigrant communities. We serve over 100,000 students each year, and I would like to turn, uh, turn to uh, Aya Ibrahim, uh, one of those 100,000. Uh, to, to speak with you just for a few minutes. Aya? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. And as a youth member striving to do my best and reach my dreams, 
I'm a first generation immigrant and a first generation to go to college. I was clueless how, on how to navigate and tackle this process. But JA came at a time when I needed support, when I needed guidance, when I needed someone to show me how to unlock my potential. All of my JA experiences from learning on uh, learning soft and hard skills and financial literacy and just having that entrepreneurial mindset to start our own company. All of these experiences have had a great impact on me and helped me look 10 years ahead, getting me both college and career ready. Um, every experience brings me a closer, brings me a step closer to achieving my dreams. So it will be a great opportunity if every student in New York City gets this chance to help them strive in their careers. Uh, thank you for giving me the time to share my story and I would be very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Now, turn to the council member for questions. Seeing no questions from the members, uh, we will now turn to our next panelists. Um, some of the original pan panelists I called are no longer here, so we will skip ahead. The next panelist will be Marjorie Parker, followed by Martha Camber and Larry Wood. Ms. Parker, you may begin. Time starts now. Ms. Parker, are you here? Ms. Parker is muted. Can you mute her? Please unmute her. Ah, got it. Thank you so much. I'm trying to navigate multiple meetings here. Um, so good afternoon, Chair Presses, Rose, Chen, Kalos, and distinguished members of the Youth Services Aging and Contract Committee. My name is Marjorie Parker, and I am the President and CEO at Jostlers NYC. We're a nonprofit intermediary that creates and advances solutions to break down barriers and transform the systems supporting young adults and their communities in the pursuit of economic opportunities. The unemployment rate in May 2020 among young people, ages 16 to 24, has skyrocketed due to COVID, rising to 35% from its pre-pandemic rate of 6.6%. For young adults, a recession can have much longer lasting consequences and young adults today may even have harder time because they have more student loan debt. To understand the breadth of the pandemic um, economic impact on young adults, their communities and their organizations that support them, Jobsters conducted interviews with 68 of our 150 partner institutions across New York City. Um, the resulting report is called The Early Impact of COVID-19 on Young Adult Workforce Development Insights from the Sphere. I want to give you some quick highlights about that. It's all detailed in the in the report. But I first I want to say that um, you know the, the New York City Council passed a resolution that was enacted in April 25th, 2017, which charged Mayor de Blasio to launch a New York City disconnected task force that would work to develop a single system strategy to for real investment in the out of school, out of work population. Um, that report, that first report was due to the City Council on March 1st. Um, I know that you do not have that report. And so we're uh, really asking you to um, reach out to the team at the mayor's office who's working on this um, to share this report. We're really disappointed in the lack of leadership that Mayor de Blasio has shown on this group. So to the report, right? Um, these are 68 organizations that Talk work with young adults. Um, very quickly, um, household finances are declining rapidly. Having a job has become a matter of, matter of life or death for young people. Uh, young adults and nonprofit staff are facing rising mental and physical health needs. Someone asked a question earlier about, you know, are the agencies talking to their contract, um, their nonprofits, and what are they hearing? Well, you can you can find this in this report because we talk to them. Funding is flexible right now, but nonprofits are bracing for drastic cuts. Um, the one thing that we're asking for for the city council, well, three things. Hold the line in cutting funding for critical programs, convert current funding to general operation support. I don't know how the government can do that, but they should. Um, nonprofits need time to right size. Think about this. We're operating in a time, having a type of experience that we've never had. Um, we're spending money on resources that we 
really don't have money to spend on. Um, we need to invest in mental health counseling and support services. Um, and we need more institutional partnerships across workforce and, educa and the education system. The full um, testimony is, um, we email this to you, but I wanna thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Unless there are any questions from the chairs, I will move on to the next panelist. Seeing no questions from the chairs, I will move on to our next panelist, Larry Wood, followed by Deborah Sue Lorenzen, followed by Madaha Kinsey Lamb. Mr. Wood, you may begin your testimony. Time starts thank now. Thank you. I want to um, thank my council member, Helen Rosenthal, as well as the committee chairs, uh, Chin, uh, Rose, and Kalos for this opportunity. Um, I work at uh, Goddard Riverside. We're a settlement house based on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, serving the West Side, Harlem, and large parts of Manhattan. We're also a proud member of UNH and live on New York. Uh, so we uh, uh, echo their testimony given earlier. And I, I just want to do a shout out and uh, thank Colin for her powerful testimony from the CPC um, and also for her leadership uh, in circulating sign on letters and calls to actions in the human service uh, community. It's very important that type of leadership. And I want to thank her for her testimony. Uh, God of Riverside is not as big as some of those other agencies, but we run two senior centers, two NORC programs, uh, multiple daycare Head Start sites, uh, after school programs. We also have the contract to do outreach to the chronically street homeless throughout uh, Manhattan. We're supposed to expand it to Queens with the new safe haven uh, in the coming year, which would be new for us to operate outside of Manhattan. Um, and we also run supported housing um, for the formerly homeless. Um, this has been a very difficult time. And you know, honestly, I gotta say, we're just basically frightened to death about the budget cuts and the layoffs and the impact it's gonna have on the communities we serve, um, particularly youth services and the SYEP cuts. Um, we've already laid off a number of staff. Um, the rest of the staff, their last day is next week on June 30th. Um, and it's heartbreaking to, to see people I've worked with for years, in some cases decades, are being let go at this time when their services are needed more than ever. Um, I, we just cannot accept the notion that hundreds of thousands of young people are not going to have a productive, safe place to go and to be engaged for their own personal growth and professional development. It just seems so short-sighted. It's so short-sighted. And I guess just in summarizing, uh, I wanna urge you to keep funding for human services as whole as possible. We do have to defund the police. And I'm proud to say that God of Riverside has signed on to every letter that's come our way to that effect. We need to, we need to do it smartly. We don't need the police doing homeless outreach. We don't need the police in our school system. Uh, we need to downsize the police and put that where the uh, would do the most good in human services and also look at some of the revenue enhances that the independent budget offices put out there because cutting the police is not enough. We got to cut the police, we got to raise revenue, and we have to push forth in keeping our city as healthy as possible. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Wood. I'll now turn to Chair Kalos for questions. Uh, th thank you for uh, your testimony. Once you went over the time, you, you actually ended up answering my line of questioning, which I, I was going to ask just along the lines of defund NYPD about whether or not uh, we should be using police to do homeless outreach and using police to force homeless off of subway cars and out of public spaces, uh, or if we should be working with organizations like Goddard Riverside, which I believe covers most of uptown Manhattan, and what the difference is between the training that NYPD gets and what your staff and employees and outreach workers get, and whether or not it, it is necessary to have somebody with a gun uh, while interacting with somebody who is homeless, chronically homeless, has a may have a mental health challenge or a substance abuse challenge. Uh I'll try to answer that question. Uh, I mean, th there are times where we do work in conjunction with the police, but that's pretty rare. Um, it really undermines the 
in, uh, very intense long-term work uh, to engage a homeless man or woman out on the streets of New York. It takes a lot of visits. Um, I've been dealing with emails from both Gail Brewer and Helen Roosevelt today about particular homeless people at what's happening, what, what can be done. Um, and, you know, there's privacy issues. We can't be that uh, we can't be that specific about folks, um, but it takes a lot of outreach to win trust. Um, there's a pair of uh, twin sisters, not twins, but there's sisters here on the Upper West Side residing around 86th Street between Broadway and Amsterdam and back and forth. Um, it was only recently they've started engaging our staff. So we really hope that they're going to, uh, if we have a place to refer them, some permanent housing or a safe haven, and those are in short supply. We need to have real places to refer people as well. Um, but when you engage them over a long period of time, you win some trust, they're willing to take some assistance, then you can get them the assistance they need. That's often undermined when you do have a, a police officer with you. Um, it's, it's just a whole different kind of experience. We don't do outreach to the subways and we haven't been involved with that aspect. I think that's the Bowery Residence Committee. Correct. Um, it's, it's very difficult though I, I, to find that right balance. But for the most part, the, home, the police themselves do not have the appropriate training. Uh, and the same could be said for crisis intervention teams. I didn't say it in my testimony, but the crisis intervention teams are needed uh, to intervene into uh, from emotionally disturbed men and women. Uh, again, just sending the police out there uh, does not uh, end well in a lot of cases. We need trained professionals to do that type of outreach to the homeless and to people in emotional crisis. Larry, you mentioned uh, that you get uh, emails about specific folks, just something I'll put on the table here. On the east side, when the crisis really started to peak and the mayor really hadn't taken a position on it, I co-founded the east side task force for homeless outreach and services. We bring my office, uh, other elected officials, Gail Brewer is one of them, uh, Senator Kruger is another, and faith-based organizations, nonprofits, uh, and, and Steve Banks when necessary. And we, we sit at a table, we talk about individuals in the community who need help, different people at the table who have relationships with those individuals through soup kitchens or other uh, loose contact points. And we've been very successful in, in getting people to support. So to the extent we can uh, offer that assistance uh, north or, or, out, or, or westbound or, or what have you, we are we are open to, to working and expanding the model. We, we do know it works, and we've been able to get some pretty amazing results for people. Thank you. Yeah, team effort makes a difference. Thank you. Uh, the, the only cost is in order to sit at the table, you have to be willing to build supportive housing or a <laughs> shelter on your block across the street from your house. You have to be willing to, to, to do it, you, you, or we even put housing in your building. And, and I will say I actually have... Uh, supportive housing in my building. I have it across the street. I have folks going to the same school my daughter will go to. So that is the price. So, so if you're willing to pay that price, we'd love to work with you. I, I've actually, I've been at God of Riverside for 33 years and uh, a good part of that was with the SRO Law Project. So I worked within many SROs before they became supported housing and a firm supporter. Around the corner for me is Euclid Hall run by Wishfish. Uh, a lot of my friends live in there. <laughs> so it's not just buildings in the neighborhood. They're my uh, friends and community members. And uh, I'm so glad they're still here and I've been pushed out of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Seeing no additional questions from the members, we'll now turn to the next panelist. The next panelist will be Deborah Sue Lorenzen, followed by Madaha Kinsey Lamb, followed by Irene Branch. Ms. Lorenzen, you may begin your testimony. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about DYCD contracts during this difficult time. My name is Deborah Sue Lorenzen, and I am the Director of Youth and Education for St. Nick's Alliance. As the largest youth services provider in North Brooklyn and one of the largest SYEP providers in New York City, St. Nick's Alliance has 21 DYCD contracts valued at $6.27 million including nine SYP contracts totaling over $1 million. 
Mock's deputy director, Galing, indicated in her testimony that a goal of Mock's was to stabilize the nonprofit sector. Certainly, the initial flexibility on our Compass, Sonic, Beacon, and Cornerstone contracts was a reassuring and stabilizing force for our organization and for the thousands of children, family, and seniors who desperately needed our services. However, voluminous contract compliance requirements has severely strained our program and fiscal staff. It often feels like every day brings new urgent demands, often with conflicting information, even within DYCD itself. Most destabilizing, however, was the unconscionable decision of New York City to eliminate reimbursements on our SYP contracts with one day's notice. Still reeling from this financial blow, summer camp was eliminated about a week later. For St. Nick's Alliance, these dramatic changes to our contracts are valued at some $2 million. These cuts destabilize the lives of children, families, staff, our organization, and the field at large. Moving forward, we urge MOX and DYCD to prevent this short-term damage from long-term negative effects. Of course, we are advocating for the full refund of DYCD and all of its contracts. But beyond that, we need to ensure that contracts for SYP providers, particularly those at the scale, we have executing contracts at the scale that St. Nick's is, has sufficient investments to allow for the fall in preparation for summer 2021. We will never get where we need to be for next summer if we're not providing service, you know, building towards those service requirements this year. We need to replace SYP's three-month and nine-month contract model to a 12-month contract to reduce the gross administrative burden and allow for increased flexibility. We need to allow flexibility in our DYCD contracts so that we can continue to meet the blended learning models and shifting needs of our children during the school year. We need to provide reimbursements on contracts this summer. So the field at large is not forced to furlough some 14,000 staff including 250 staff at St. Nick's Alliance, and we will not be providing jobs for some 2,500 young people through SYP and another 50 plus staff that we hired just for SYP over the summer. And lastly, we need to resolve the extreme backlog for New York City Department of Health clearances, without which youth services pro providers cannot be in full compliance with the SAC regulations and our DYCD contracts that are coming down the pike in September. So thank you for your kind consideration of this testimony. Thank you. I'll now turn it over to Chair Chin for some additional remarks. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to Chair Kalos and Chair Rose for uh, co-chairing this important hearing today. And I really want to thank all the service provider for our youth programs, senior programs, social service program for coming to testify today. We have to fight for a fair and equitable, bud equitable budget that will protect our youth, our senior immigrants, vulnerable population, and human services. And we were gonna, and we have to work very hard in the next couple of days. I have to sign off because I'm on the budget negotiation team. Uh, together with uh, Council Member Rose. So I just wanted to uh, show my appreciation to all of you for being here and let's continue uh, to raise our voices so that we can have a truly equitable budget this year. Thank you. I wanna thank uh, Aging Chair uh, Margaret Chin for, for staying throughout most of the hearing. I think we only have like a couple of folks left. Just had one quick, uh, question for our last panelist. Uh, you mentioned having issues with uh, compliance with regulations, and I was just curious if I could get another 30 seconds on those regulations, or if you could send your concerns relating the regulatory matter to contracts at bencalos.com. Sure. Are you speaking about the school-age child care license um, regulations? So as you probably know, last year there was a dramatic change in the DOH regulations that was set down by the OCFS. And um, the Department of Health just has been terribly backlogged all year, even prior to um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. 
and they have only fallen further behind. So organizations like mine have hundreds of staff who are not properly cleared at this time because their clearances have been expiring. It's really quite a, um, it's a quite a difficult hurdle for the, for the field at large to um, jump over without changes. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you heard at the beginning of the uh, uh, hearing, but I, I was home with my two-year-old and uh, child care is kind of an issue I cared about before I was a parent and even more so now that I am in it. Uh, and so if you are still experiencing these backlogs, which were supposed to be cleared up last year this time, uh, please let us know. Let any other organizations know. If anyone's watching, just email contracts at bencalos.com. We will work with you to get these contracts addressed. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. We will now call upon Madaha Kinsey Lamb, followed by Irene Branch, followed by Lena Villa-Kutasaka. Madaha Kinsey Lamb, you may begin your testimony. Time starts now. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, dedicated officials and electeds. Thank you for your concern, as well as for your commitment to arrive at just and thoughtful future policies and for the distribution of public funds in these extraordinary times. Mind Builders Creative Arts Center creates, conducts classes and community productions with more than 750 youth and families each year. My name is Madaha Kinsey Lamb, and I'm the executive director and founder. Current statistics for our neighborhood show that this zip code, 10467, has the highest numbers of COVID-19 infection in all of New York City. Within two weeks of the New York City shutdown order, we had transitioned all of our classes to online so that close to 75% of our students continue to participate in over 225 weekly online classes that we provided at no charge. As soon as we opened registration for the first of our online summer offerings, we quickly received 140 applications for the limited 20 slots we had available for one of the special online summer programs for teens. Youth services are indeed essential and must be kept whole. Since we began with arts education more than 40 years ago, we have known that we serve a vulnerable population. It's why we have always been about providing more than quality music, dance, and theater classes, or UBK, community folk culture research, and visual arts classes. At Mind Builders, we work alongside students, parents, grandparents, and more than 34 dedicated teaching artists who are employed to empower our children in our community to build self-esteem, help students prepare for college scholarship auditions, or gain access to specialized high schools, free tutoring that we provide, and individual or group counseling when needed, to ultimately have young people realize an unlimited and fulfilling vision of themselves that they may never have thought possible as global citizens in whatever profession they ultimately choose. Without critical New York City support, through speaker, member, delegation items, DCLA, Coalition of Theaters of Color, Cultural Immigrant Initiative, and DOE, we would not be here today and could not have become the force that we are for hope and leadership in this community. We are grateful for all that has helped to make our services possible in our underserved community, an area that is also referred to as a cultural desert. Now, the need for what we CBOs do has never been greater. The inequities endured by 12 generations continue to be evidenced in our communities every single day and must finally begin to be rectified. We cannot leave our children and teens unoccupied all day for months without constructive activities for the use of their minds and talents. We thank you for your support and for the courage and wisdom you will continue to demonstrate towards this goal. Thank you. Unless there are any questions from the members, we will move on to the next panelist. Seeing no additional questions from the members, we will move on to Irene Branch, followed by Lena Billick, followed by Nashorn Adu. 
Ms. Branch, you may begin your testimony. Great, Time thank starts you. now. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in the conversation today. I am with the HOPE program, uh, an organization based in downtown Brooklyn and the South Bronx that empowers New Yorkers, including young adults and um, our senior citizens to build sustainable careers through comprehensive training, jobs, career advancement, and lifelong support. Um, I actually would rather that my colleague who is sitting in the attendee room under the same name, I would rather her uh, have the opportunity to testify. So I was wondering if a host could pull her in. Um, her name is Dejanae Cheney and, and she, she's gonna be much more interesting to listen to than I am. Is she under the name Ivan she, Branch as well? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're sharing a login. <laughs> Will the muter please un un unmute her? Thank you. She's still muted. Will the muter please unmute her? You may need to click unmute. On hey, can, can you click unmute on your screen? So sorry. That's all right. Apologies. If you don't mind, uh, Dejanae has a really brief statement. If you don't mind, I'm going to um, call her and have her read her statement over the phone for, for the panel to hear. Um, we just we try just, one more wait, time because wait. I think we've managed to unmute her. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. One second. Okay. Thank you. Got Hello, it. everyone. Yes. Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Dejanae Cheney. I am a 23 year old single mom, Bronx resident, as well as a born and bred New Yorker. I have just moved out of the shelter system to my own apartment. I recently graduated from the HOPE program's remote training where I was able to gain a paid internship with HOPE. My duties consist of calling members of my community to educate them about the importance of the census. The census is a fundamental property that provides accurate funding for the people in the Bronx who need it most. Thanks to HOPE, I am building my resume and earning a paycheck at the same time. At first, I was very intimidated. This is the first job where I've ever had to call people. But then I realized talking to people is what I love to do. I have very big dreams for me and my daughter. I know I have a very bright future as well because I fight for myself and in part because of the whole program. I hope the city council will increase funding for the programs like these because when you invest in your community, the entire community grows for all of us. We all benefit. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now turn to the members for questions. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to the next panelist. I'll now call Nina Billick, followed by Helen Kogan. Ms. Billick, you may begin your testimony. Good afternoon. Uh, my name Morning is Nina Billick, policy analyst at Children's Aid. I would like to thank Chairs Rose, Kalos, and Chin for this opportunity to testify. For over 167 years, Children's Aid has been committed to ensuring there are no boundaries to the aspirations of young people. Today, we empower nearly 50,000 children, youth, and their families, and have continued our services during the pandemic. Children's Aid is a member of Campaign for Children and stands with nonprofit youth services providers deeply concerned with the well being of New York City's young people this summer and beyond. The mayor's budget cuts to summer funding for Beacons, Compass, Sonic, Cornerstones and SYP leave 175,000 youth without support this summer. Three weeks ago, the mayor made a commitment to shift funds to NYPD from NYPD to youth services. But today, youth programs are closing because the mayor has not fulfilled that promise. We must fully fund youth services this summer and beyond. During the COVID crisis, nonprofits have shifted programming to adapt to our community's needs and safety, and we've experienced unforeseen costs. We need and deserve the city's support. We have serious concerns about the sustainability of the nonprofit sector, and we ask that the council push the administration to support nonprofits by 
providing robust cash advances for FY21 contracts, recouping advances at the end of contracts, not at the end of years, paying invoices immediately, investing in our sector's remote work needs as we continue to provide critical services remotely, supporting providers now with continuing emergency funds, and pushing contracting agencies like DYCD to provide much more consistent, responsive, and transparent communication with providers during these uncertain times. We believe that if we work together, we can make sure the budget represents our city's values by strengthening the crucial human services programs that keep our communities safe and invest in our city's future. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now turn to Ms. Shorn Adu, followed by Helen Kogan. Ms. Shorn Adu, you may begin your testimony. Starting. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to the council for holding this hearing today and for creating space for a service provider to state our concerns. I am Nashame Adu. I'm the policy director at Expanded School, which is an intermediary that provides coaching, technical assistance, and funding for after school programs. Over the past five years, Expanded Schools has received discretionary funding from the council that supports um, the After Three Enrichment, the After Three Initiative which supports after-school enrichment, as well as the middle school um, expanded learning program, which is also known as MS Extra, which focuses in on um, liter literacy report for young people, with also for after three a component that supports um, SYEP for 24 schools and school and community partnerships. And as we all know, COVID-19 has shed light on the many inequities that our communities and our youth face on a daily basis, inequities that service providers um, present here on this call who've spoken today are devoted to responding to and restoring. Our current climate of heightened awareness around anti-Black racism has also revealed how deeply rooted these inequities are. And as community voices have demanded restorative justice, we want to ensure that we are able to provide these services that support youth and community development during this critical time. Our families need services for, for their children that provide them with safe and productive outlets supplement learning loss that has accrued over the past three months as adults return to work and seek out employment opportunities. As an intermediary, we support community-based organizations that have been providing these essential services. And throughout our history of this partnership, we support the integration of human services and advise on best practices of the funds being dispersed. Thanks to the contractual flexibilities, many programs have been able to continue providing services that have made all the difference in how our city has responded to this current crisis. We ask for these flexibilities to be maintained as we enter a still very uncertain FY21 um, fiscal year. And as we continue to rise to, this, rise to this challenge as a city, we hope that we can work together to provide a just and equitable recovery, specifically by funding youth services um, this summer, as well as into the fall, for all the reasons that have been stated during this hearing for young people to have the opportunity to really be fully developed in ways that they were not able to this, this school year um, and really embracing the summer, knowing that there are certain concerns about them not having anything to do with their time and needing support um, both academically and socially, emotionally. Also allowing for flexibilities that um, provide a hybrid between virtual and in-person enrichment as we look to certain public health guidance and community concerns about safety um, and really needing to be flexible in how we move forward and, and supporting the community throughout this fiscal year. Allocating proper funds for PPE, which is something that was very much lacking over this past year, as was also mentioned here, continuing the COLA adjustments to further support um, community-based organizations and providing the services that they need, and continuing and really pushing for open and consistent communication between DYCD and service providers. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. We'll now call upon Helen Hogan for a testimony. As a reminder, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Ms. Hogan, you may begin. Hello, Start. can you hear me? Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present testimony to the committees. And thank you to the City Council for your guidance during the crisis, um, many of whom we at NPower have worked with. I am Helen Kogan. I am the executive director for NPower New York. 
we are a free technology training and workforce development program specifically for underserved young adults in New York City. Prior, prior to the pandemic, in New York City, there were almost 300,000 disconnected youth who were neither working nor in school. And we have seen during the pandemic that there was an unprecedented impact on the way we live and we work. We need to frame this emerging new norm within the context of a technology-driven era. The future of work is in tech, and tech, tech will drive the new economy, economy that will emerge after the crisis. In addition to the disproportional health and economic impact of the pandemic on low-income communities, it has further illuminated the breadth of the digital divide. And small businesses and nonprofits that service our community have been negatively affected because of technology needs and the demand for tech talent. Therefore, upskilling young adults will serve as a critical need to combat generational poverty experienced by our community. Programs like NPower have made a clear difference in the lives of thousands of underserved young New Yorkers. Our organization is the link between non-traditional job seekers and the employers hiring IT and digital talent, creating an alternative fast track to jobs for young adults from low income communities on a citywide scale. A rigorous training program and job placement program turns job seekers into employed professionals with certifications by providing students with intensive technical training, professional development, internship experience, and social services. And we pivoted seamlessly to an entirely virtual content delivery format, and we continue to offer virtual training throughout the end of the year. Programs like ours are greatly positioned to help our city during the recovery by recruiting yeah, disconnected required. and underserved and under-resourced young adults. Training them with up-to-date skills and finding them well-paying jobs in the middle school job, in middle skills jobs in the ever-growing tech industry in New York. These jobs will not only impact the lives of our students, but that of their families and their communities. It is critical that life-altering programs like NPower and other nonprofits in the city continue to be funded. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. As a reminder, if your name has not been called and you still wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no hands raised, this concludes our testimony of registered panelists. I will now turn the floor over to Chair Kalos for closing remarks. Chair Kalos, you may begin. I wanna start with a huge thank you to the Aging Committee Chair, Margaret Chen, and the Youth Services Chair, Debbie Rose, for their uh, leadership on these issues. We felt it was important to hear from the nonprofit service providers, particularly in light of some of the testimony that we did hear on the record for the world to hear about how we have an administration that has been saying one thing, putting out guidance that said those same similar things and is talking about how there's all this funding available at the same time as our nonprofit providers on the front lines are, are feeling the pain. Uh, we've heard really what's at stake. Uh, we've heard about matters of life and death uh, we've gotten to hear compelling stories from uh, young, uh, uh, young people with their children and how they've been able to have access to paid internships. Uh, we've gotten to hear about job training opportunities. And uh, we've also heard a lot about defunding the NYPD and using those monies to invest in our communities instead of policing those communities. And I'm hoping that as we have this hearing and we hear these conversations that we can see the funding secured by the city council uh, led by Speaker Johnson, that we can pass a council budget if the mayor won't come to the table, that we can fully fund our nonprofit providers and even go further than just restoring existing funding, but actually get universal youth jobs, universal summer camp, universal after school and create a comprehensive uh, support system with a lot of the funds that we might be able to pull from NYPD, uh, but also just the hundreds of millions, if not billions of waste that we've already identified in the city's budget and that we discussed throughout this hearing. Uh, there's a lot at stake. There's seven days left. Uh, we need to get this done. Uh, we're here to uh, support you. If you did not get a chance to provide testimony, uh, you can still submit it for another 48 hours. Uh, and that can be emailed to, I believe, correspondence at council.nyc.gov. 
www.ncpsa.gov. And uh, if any of the nonprofits or anyone on this call uh, needs assistance or wants to blow the whistle, you can always email me at contracts at bencalos.com and uh, we will work with you and support you and try to make sure we get our cities back on track and make sure we know how every penny is being spent in our city and that every penny is going to direct services to our residents as much as possible. Uh, with all of that being said, and thank yous to all, I hereby adjourn this meeting. <laughs>